way of promoting the exchange of knowledge in several areas about relevant and current topics, information, research, plurality of ideas, high-level debate, all of this happening daily, online, and free of charge. Welcome to another FGV webinar. The state room is expressed by Fundação Getúlio Vargas employee and guests who take part in online events and broadcasts represent exclusively their opinions and not necessary FGG's institution position. A good morning, good morning to all. Welcome primeira conferência to this first uh, Latin American Congress about artificial intelligence and uh, data privacy. This is a satellite uh, event from the Latin America Conference of Data Protection and Intelligent Artificial Intelligence, uh, sponsored here above by FGV. I am Luca Belli, a professor here in Rio, and I coordinate this uh, part. And today, together with my friend, uh, Professor that is also a member of the National Council in Data Privacy. I'm going to moderate this first session of this uh, conference. Before I start, we have some homework here to do, and we have to read our traditional disclaimer. And I would like also to show the screen with all the speakers on the first section so that they give us our consent to do the statements that are expressed by Fundação Getúlio Vargas employees and guests who take part in online events and broadcasts represent only their opinions and not necessarily FGV's institutional position. We also emphasize that everyone present here who has spontaneously agreed to participate in this event and authorize the use of their name, voice, and image, as well as assigning the copyrights related to their exhibition for this broadcast. We will be enabled later on FGV's official channels. To confirm with this transmission, we ask you to verbally express your agreement or signaling with your thumb your agreement with this. I believe that you all agree. Good, excellent. So let's start before to turn the floor to my friend Danilo Zanieda and Anna Briand, our special uh, speaker. I would like to contextualize a little bit our topic today and the need of this conference today. Everybody knows very well that artificial intelligence is generating a major interest of governments, regulators, companies, civil society, and not only at a Brazilian level where we have seen things that happened last week, but also in a regional and global level. And the need of this discussion that we are doing today came as a priority during the CPG conference that we started in June. It will be an annual conference with a multi-sectoral platform for this kind of debate of technology and data privacy. And on the other sessions, the topic of artificial intelligence was discussed and uh, the other stakeholders, representatives uh, of the different sectors, they recognize that the evolution of artificial intelligence can bring major benefits, but also several risks. So the regulatory framework, a governance system about intelligent, artificial intelligence is something that is important. But there are two very uh, important uh, points that I would like to highlight. The first First concerns how to regulate. While well, regulatory technique, while well, what governance mechanisms can be more efficient to reach the results that we want, and what are actually those who are useful or not useful 
Do we need lay, co-regulation, self-regulation? There are several strategies at our disposal, but this is a very interesting and important choice. It was an essential choice. Despite of the choice to be able to choose, we need a broad debate, very well structured, dynamic, with a good participation. And this is one of our objectives. And this perspective surprised many people in the Congress when they saw the, that the project 2021 was voted for the new artificial intelligence framework. And with a debate that was very short and very restricted. So I believe this very restricted uh, debate could jeopardize the quality uh, that needs a more open debate. And so my wish is that today's discussion be uh, something productive so that we can include in the development of this process, there is a consensus on regulating artificial intelligence, because we know that some types of AI bring risks and are bad risks, not only for society manipulation of democracies, but also national security, but also as an individual level. Data protection, the topic today, is a topic that is essential. And then we come to the second point that I would like to highlight, that when we consider that there is already laws for data protection worldwide and in Latin America, in Brazil, that already have principles, rights, and obligations that have to be enforced, that they exist, that they are part of that framework that we have in our disposition. And the principles, uh, the purposes, uh, the adjustment, the prevention, quality of data, there are many principles principles that exist in most of the laws uh, found in the region. And to these principles correspond obligations and duties. M many of the laws uh, that talk about access to information in uh, the use of data, the LGPD, the Brazilian law, gives us the right of uh, requesting revision of things made. And this topic exists to together with this discussion. So we have to understand how to implement efficiently, effectively, uh, the regulatory frameworks that already exist. So today's event wants to explore some of these challenges that are very big for Latin America. And before turning the floor to Danilo and then to our special speaker, Anna Brian, I would like to highlight that more research is needed. And we are introducing today a new call of assets of the CPDT LATAM about artificial intelligence and data protection in Latin America to do a necessary research. So I invite you all to visit the site cpdp.latam, where we Having introduced uh, this call, we will have scholarships provided too. And with these words, I would like to invite Danilo for his uh, introduction. And then we will have the pleasure of having Anna Brian with her first words. Thank you, Luke. I'm not even going to do an introduction, just a few words. Thank you, the presence of all the guests that we were able to have an exceptional panel here in terms of speakers uh, this event is very important not only concerning the topic and its pertinence but also to consolidate the continuity and the persistent feature that this project cpdt by latam has and now talking about artificial intelligence and data protection and data protection is the entrance uh, for those essential issues of uh, regulation of artificial intel intelligence via the legislative way. And uh, we have seen that all of these discussions are very present in laws for data protection. This started in the 1980s in their formulations, and not even in Brazil uh, is being so much discussed, uh, and even in a very accelerated way. Not even here, it is something new uh, that the legislative ban, the law of the positive registration in Brazil since 2011 already included something as a right to explanation, a right to revision, and maintains this right to revision and objection in uh, different ways. 
that uh, was given in the final form. And today we see with artificial intelligence and many elements about data protection because it is uh, the raw material of artificial intelligence, intelligence, personal data. And uh, several points about empowerment, uh, the, the defense of rights, uh, that now uh, include ethical points uh, and others. But uh, I am not going to uh, talk about this topic because this is not my function and it's not even in my capacity. I just would like to remind you that this uh, project of the law that was approved by the chamber it could have uh, caught uh, the attention of uh, foreign uh, researchers, but it was a surprise uh, together with some concern of researchers and people connected to the industry here in Brazil because of an absence of a more encompassing debate and also because of the nature of the speed of some decision made. I will mention only one, a subjective responsibility, for instance, as a standard in artificial intelligence tools, it goes against, I believe, I don't say the trends, but the need of a, a deeper discussion in several dynamics of this point that are present with much uh, uh, more uh, depth in international documents of the European Parliament, etc. But uh, I closing my first words, I declare that I'm very happy to be here. Anna Bryan, my friend that I have seen for quite a while, and also say how happy I am as a Brazilian and a South American to have the first special report about privacy in the United Nations, being a Latin American woman. I know Anna for a long time in the Ibero-American, uh, with a militants uh, on the academia and the government, uh, and uh, in her work as an advocate of data protection. I believe this is the beginning of a very good journey to all of us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Danilo. And just to highlight the dream team that we have here with us in the, both the sections, clearly we are going to highlight, first of all, this first section, we will start with Anna Bian who is the special uh, speaker for the United Nations. And then we will have Jacqueline Conca, Subsecretary for Innovation and Digital Transformation of the Ministry here in Brazil. And uh, Anna Ducol, that is the manager of policies uh, and in artificial intelligence in Facebook. And the second segment, we will have Karen Duque, uh, who is also manager of public policies here in Brazil. And then very Jana de Monti, that is senior expert in electronic frontier foundations uh, with a focus on Latin American. And last but not least, and in an hour that has just joined our team in the CTS and that is also a member of the TikTok uh, Security Council. So, I would like to introduce our star of today, Anna Brian, who was appointed a special reporter of ONU for the, the right of privacy in July when we inaugurated CPDT Latam. Good luck for Anna Brian. And I make Danilo's words mine. It's a pleasure to see, especially to have a women reporter about data protection and a woman in Latin America, a friend that has always provided us a lot of support. And uh, she was graduated by the University of Uruguay with more than 20 years of experience, as Danilo mentioned, and also a professor of the University of the Republic of Montevideo, of the University of Montevideo. So, Anna, please, uh, you have the floor. Look, it's just a question. Anna had a connection problem. She is reconnecting right now. Oh, okay. So, uh,
I would like to, to highlight that to this first section, we will have a focus mainly on the Brazilian ecosystem, but also as several international connections with the, the first words of Anna, that uh, despite uh, being a Latin American woman, now because of uh, the mandate of her has a greater focus, a global focus, I could also start using this moment while Anna Brienne will uh, try to reconnect to introduce the others. Uh, so we have, we can save a little time in the introductions after Anna returns. Uh, I was mentioning after Anna, we will have uh, Jacqueline Conca. And in this moment is uh, the working in the Ministry of the Economy in Brazil as a deputy secretary. And she did international relationships and she has it as her background and a fellow for the fourth industrial revolution. And then we will have uh, Faziana, who will bring a very interesting part with her work in Facebook. But before joining Facebook, she worked in the Agency for Artificial Intelligence of the Government of the United Kingdom. And she, she has this uh, triple experience work for the government and also has academic uh, uh, qualification and carrying Duki with also a qualification in international relationships uh, and a good presence in governmental relationships in the public and private sector and uh, very generally Monti who's a friend almost for a decade now and that everybody who work in the digital rights, they know her very well. She also was a, a member of uh, the Council of Data Protection here in Brazil. And Nina Dara, that uh, this uh, by being a computer scientist, you also find time to be a researcher in our project Cyber Greeks. And also she is a member of the TikTok Security Council. And she also has a podcast and she also writes a column in the MIT Tech Review. And so she has a, a very busy agenda. Right. So, I cannot see Anna. Anna, have you any news from Anna? She has, she's having a connection problem. She's trying to solve this now. I would suggest that we'll, we should call, start with the other panelists and then we continue with Anna. Okay, as we say, the show must go on. So, Danilo, I would like to leave you to introduce the Jacqueline and then and uh, we'll, we'll start. So, okay. So beginning uh, this first round of panelists and inaugurating the panel, I have the honor and the pleasure to introduce to Jacqueline Contra, uh, the Subsecretary of the Ministry of the Economy here in Brazil. And she has a lot of experience in artificial intelligence. She has worked uh, with uh, the government in other instances with this uh, topic. And I thank very much for the presence and for having accepted uh, our invitation. Thank you, Jacqueline, and I turn the floor to you. Right. Thank you. Hello to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about this important topic the technological development of all countries, but especially developing countries in the economy based on data, where we have more data than people. Uh, I will uh, present you my personal opinion, not the opinion of the Brazilian Ministry of Economy, and talking about the situation in Brazil, data protection, regulation, 
recently we heard Brad Mitten, president of Microsoft, that uh, BBC 2024, we might have a future as George Orwell in his famous work um, will be here if the race between US and China is not regulated. When we see people uh, stating this, this stresses the worries and threats what the people think when we talk about artificial intelligence. We have many AI systems in decision-taking processes on all levels. I prefer to believe that we have more opportunities and ecological, social and economic gains than threats. In this context of huge uncertainties and stabilities, we would like to stress the role of the public uh, sector. And Brazil accepted the recommendation of the definition of uh, artificial intelligence policies and regulations. So we have the basic framework. Then we had the publication of the National Strategy for Artificial Intelligence in April this year by the Ministry of uh, Science, Innovation and Technology. More than 30 entities uh, are members of the strategy and are uh, implementing concrete uh, steps, elaborating ethic guidelines about how to use artificial intelligence, promoting investment for infrastructure and development or artificial intelligence, uh, abolishing barriers for the development and so on. So today, over 60 countries already launched their AI uh, strategies in the uh, Congress uh, was discussed a new law, a framework. This will be discussed in Senate. This brings about improvements for our uh, regulatory framework. We know that the challenge to regulate emerging technologies, this is not just about artificial intelligence, is difficult. You need the proper balance to have progress and development, but at the same time, you have to take care of democratic, ethic values, safety and security, and many things still have to be developed. So in my opinion, the regulation, if it's too excessive, it might hinder development, might block progress. In a phase where we don't know yet the negative and the positive impacts of this technology. In Brazil, we have a strong uh, production in the uh, field of uh, artificial intelligence. If uh, the rules are too strict, it will um, slow down the development and the scientific productions might lag behind. The same applies for patents. Brazil is uh, ranking eight, considering patents and uh, in scientific production. And uh, there are several reasons, and this we have, uh, we have a consens that uh, we are at the beginning of the discussion of artificial intelligence and the regulation should uh, be based on principles and we should uh, set out for self-regulation on a sectorial level. We need, of course, safeguards, uh, consider uh, the basic principles, transparency as uh, to protect uh, the industries and uh, you need mitigation measures considering the risks. So the proposal being discussed in Brazil is inspired on the project we have in Europe and European Union. So it's based on risk assessment. Of course, 
we um, can have the same solutions uh, for artificial intelligence in plans to make predictive maintenance and uh, for example for facial recognition so it depends on the application depends on the use so here in brazil we don't have uh, a priori definitions the european proposal also these with uh, facial recognition systems and that this is uh, uh, too great a risk and so it should be forbidden and uh, we in brazil don't do that and i think it's right for us right now so we um, intervene only when it's strictly necessary to what we have in the u.s um, so you have uh, um, proper regulation for um, algorithm in the health sector. So you need sectoral rules. If it's too general, you can uh, fill in the blanks. It would be done by the judiciary. And I think this is not the proper way to go forward. In our ministry uh, and the area of development, we work together with the center of the force in the and we are carrying out practical tests, pilot projects to better understand how to mitigate uh, the risk of emerging technologies, but not hinder the development and the upsurge of new technologies. Now we are developing a project of acquiring uh, new artificial intelligence uh, technology in a responsible manner. We are doing this in partnership. We are assessing the impact of algorithm, algorithms and uh, trying to understand um, based on a real pilot project, what are the risks, what might be the mitigation mechanisms. Just to conclude, or how I see our uh, artificial intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence strategy, and the regulation, and the, the way to go forward in Brazil. We started this in September last year, but there is a um, link between artificial intelligence and personal data. We need protection, as Danilo mentioned. Our uh, General Data Protection uh, Act uh, has uh, support measures for artificial intelligence, and this is an incentive for enterprises to adopt a, a proper culture, to develop adequate infrastructure, to collect and treat the data in accordance uh, and this also applies to artificial intelligence. And uh, in the act we have for general data protection, we have mitigating mechanisms. So this is another uh, reason why we should block the development. And uh, personal data protection is important. This is sensitive data, so you need protection, you need transparency, no discrimination, and all the other fundamental principles. So personal data and the measures, uh, here we might have a revision for automatic uh, use and also the profiling and the consumer data and the controller uh, should give proper information, adequate information, so um, to uh, say what are the criteria for automatic treatment and the national um, data protection authority might uh, carry out um, audits how data are handled and uh, we also should have impact assessment report. This is an important tool to identify and assess the risks of the new technologies so that we protect all the rights. And 
of course, and we have this in our legislation, it uh, protects privacy and everything is recognized even during the development uh, process of artificial intelligence. So wrapping up, I think that our General Data Protection Act and the legal framework we are development is in line and what's being improved in Congress and will be sanctioned by the Senate are good instruments, good tools, especially when they are combined, we will have a good uh, basis, a good platform for the development of the country. And in my opinion, a regulation should focus on specific sectors, always based on risk assessment and the possibility of self-regulation of the sectors. So we don't strangulate the development, but on the other hand, we have safeguards and protections, and this will inspire more confidence to society and the users so that people are ready to use and uh, wrap the benefits. We will see what happens in the next years. And I hope that we will really use artificial intelligence so that uh, our country can grow, increase well-being, achieve a new level. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jacqueline Conca. Very interesting to hear not only what the federal government in Brazil is doing and think uh, what is essential, but also the implementation of the General Data Protection Act, the so-called LGDP in Brazil, and the principles needed to have development and progress and have a proactive stance on artificial intelligence and it's good to hear that uh, you are testing, having uh, pilot projects, and that you are paying attention to all the uh, aspects. So we will have more news in the next weeks and months. So thank you, Jacqueline. Now we will go back to Anna Bryan. She's back with us. I would like to thank her again for being here with us today. It's a huge pleasure to have you here in this panel. This was one of the first Latin American conferences where we uh, are having the privilege to have the Special Rapporteur for Privacy of the UN. And, uh, and this is a, almost a historic moment. So Anna, I would like to uh, give you the floor. So thank you again for being here, participating in our panel, in our meeting, and uh, helping us in uh, our CP Latin project. Uh, it's always good uh, to see you. Thank you. Hola, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Luca. Thank you. Luca, just at the moment when I was supposed to start, my internet connection <laughs> wasn't stable. But now I'm back. It's a pleasure to be here. So hello to everybody. I welcome everybody from the CPD and all the other colleagues uh, during the last months I had many opportunities to meet Luca and others many friends from Brazil and it's a pleasure today we have a satellite event from the CPD LATAM and the challenge was always plurality. So I congratulate you as you handled this. We have students, politicians, 
scientists, all those responsible for regulations. We also have businessmen. We have uh, um, in several players and stakeholders participating. This is enriching for everybody. And the topic today, artificial intelligence, when we go back to its beginnings, we had an invitation to learn more about human beings, about the world. Many things happened. We have so many data, and this is complex data. So many times it's difficult to distinguish what are personal data and what are not personal data. So maybe the machine can do this. So we'll have to rely on non-traditional uh, tools. We have statistics, we have math, we have uh, computers, and are they prepared to take good decisions? So can we allow that this should be like this, that we have uh, machine learning, that the machines learn and they decide, and that everything is integrated, everything is connected, machines are connected, and that they exchange our data. This is artificial intelligence, one aspect of it. But what happened to the protection of personal data? Sorry about that. I think I forgot to share my screen. I have a presentation. I'll launch it so you can see what I prepared for you. La pueden ver? Está bien? Can you see it now? Yeah, perfect, great. First, I would like to share with you the following. When I talk about data protection, it's a reflection what happened to the data privacy and protection. Some year ago, I've been working with this for 20 years. So this uh, is a new level considering data protection. At in the past, we used to say that uh, privacy is something bygone. This is the past. But when we think of today, what is data protection? And we see this graphic, especially the blue countries, where you have a general data protection law. It's about 142 countries with uh, 94 data protection authorities. So we have uh, laws, we have regulation, we have uh, progress in this field. Uh, we have progress in Africa, Asia, in uh, America, all over, and we should consider that only 65% of uh, uh, people in the world have access to internet. So on one hand, we have a huge progress, huge development, and also considering uh, protection of personal data. For example, we have someone working in public sector and uh, we should analyze this question. We are doers and we have to consider everybody. We want to protect everybody. We want to improve uh, the uh, protection of everybody. So we are a little bit anxious when the GDPR was implemented, but what brought us here was uh, an idea about data management. And this uh, reminds us what do we have to do or not. Why do they talk about GDPR? Why is it so important? Because it brought uh, a a more encompassing system to data protection because we believe that privacy more than data because they are everywhere. GDPR brings something different. In many 
countries went after this uh, reasoning. This uh, the slide shows that GDPR uh, can stop research in artificial intelligence. The evolution that is happening here in all the areas and what happens in Latin America. Uh, Latin America includes two uh, foci, uh, the North, the United States and China, that they have uh, the generation of artificial intelligence systems. And on the other side, we have the European system. So either we look for the North, and here in Latin America, we usually look to the North, and our models always come to them from the United States. But on the other side, we could cross the Atlantic and think on what is going on in Europe. So these are the basic inferences that we received from Latin America. And what is happening in Europe? In April, in Europe, there was the first implementation about artificial intelligence and facial recognition. This regulation was created and it's being studied by the Euro Chamber and by the governments of the country. It might take a year to be applied, but it is a restrictive in gender and basis. In terms of artificial intelligence, so what should we consider? For instance, in a more strictest consensus, we have the artificial intelligence of toys that can be used by children and that uh, they show violence. They are restricted by several elements that restrict their manufacturing, but there are others, the chatbots. The chatbots there are inside the artificial intelligence category, which are less harmful. So the only demanding is that the other human part on the other side can know that he's talking to a machine and not with a human being. In terms of face recognition, the trend is against what we see in the press in other countries. It is the restriction with facial recognition and biometric and biovision restrictions in public spaces. This is the, the general direction. And this was published, uh, I would like to highlight what is happening in one place and another in the world. I also would like to highlight the 15 September declaration of 15 days ago. This declaration was made by Michelle Bachelet for the Human Rights Committee for the United Nations. And I would like to say that everything that I am mentioning here is a personal and does not involve the organizations I work for. Michel Bachelet said the use of artificial intelligence can uh, threat the human rights until they are included within the safeguards and restrictions that are necessary. So this public document is available to all of you. And let's think what is happening in Latin America. We can see that Brazil is implementing systems, analyzing uh, to uh, generate equations where the data is not uh, decreased in, in face of the intelligent uh, systems. Uh, but in Uruguay, since 2019, it was approved this law for artificial intelligence uh, and with a role uh, that uh, gives uh, the practical application. And I know well, I can give you an interesting example of what is happening in Colombia is that uh, the uh, Data protection uh, has created a sandbox. A sandbox is a way of working topics of artificial intelligence from the public arena, inviting people to participate and using the principles of private by design. This seemed to me very interesting 
and we have to study this more because it's a good way of exercise and to obtain good elements. It's a, an ongoing process. And uh, for last but not least, just to uh, us to think a little bit, artificial intelligence try to simulate the human intelligence and with the empathy the moral and all the other aspects that permeates the human intelligence why should we hate them when the intelligence artificial uses them i invite you all to get inspired in these topics to find new ways of solve them that are direct problems to find solutions to innovation but always together with the human rights ethics and responsible and a point that seems to me very important in these topics is that we can obtain the participation of civil society because uh, there is an impact analysis by non-governmental organizations or by organizations of the uh, social uh, civil society and this is essential uh, so that the in artificial intelligence systems uh, can be well analyzed and be respected and respect also the essential human rights. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Anna, uh, for uh, the excellent words and also to show the needs of evaluating the impacts and the risks of other types of artificial intelligence, of all the techniques of artificial intelligence. And in this sense, I believe it will be very interesting to uh, hear the words of our next speaker, uh, Fazana Dwala, that works at Facebook and where we are experimenting in addition to the techniques of artificial intelligence, some prototypes of policies. There are some works, uh, some studies that Facebook is carrying out that are very interesting. And then I would like to turn uh, the floor to her. Thank you very much for your presence here with uh, up and please uh, Fazana, you have uh, the floor thank you so much and thank you for inviting me to be here it's truly a pleasure um <clears throat> as i was introduced i work on ai policy and governance at facebook and i have a background of um, being in government too here in the uk i'm based in the london office so it is really nice to be here at such a great international event um I mean, as we all know, AI poses novel and complex challenges to existing legal frameworks and deciding what appropriate and feasible and balanced regulation should look like isn't easy. Given the rapid advancement of new and emerging technologies and the difficulty of fully understanding their effects, there is a need for effective policies to govern their development and use. And um, Luca in his opening remarks talked about how there are many different ways in which we could potentially regulate um, something like as new as AI. And there are lots of different formulations that that regulation can take. But how would you implement efficiently and effectively existing regulatory frameworks and allowing for um, new technologies whose consequences we don't know yet to also be properly um, regulated? Well, having said that, and I'm glad um, that Anna also mentioned um, sandboxes as one particular, uh, particularly interesting model. Um, it's interesting that new rules, I think at least will be most effective when they've been given the opportunity to be tested through controlled experimentation before being rolled out en masse. And so I'd like to spend a little bit of time today talking to you about experimental governance and in our case, um, policy prototyping and um, discussing these innovative ways in which we can use multi-stakeholder, multi-sectoral collaboration to come up with effective ways in which to regulate and govern a complex technology such as AI. It's a method and a process that we've been using quite effectively here at Facebook for some time now. And I just thought it'd be good to share with you, <clears throat> excuse me, some of our experiences um, and some of the things that we learned. Before I get into that though, I think it is important to just di differentiate and distinguish a little bit between the regulatory sandboxes on the one hand and the policy prototyping that I'll be talking about um, on the other. 
Um, as you may know, regulatory sandboxes are useful when we're trying to reform existing rules to accommodate technological advances, usually under a regulator's oversight. But regulatory sandbox are often, because of this, quite formali for formalistic in nature, and they operate within the boundaries of an existing piece of legislation, which may sometimes grant specific temporary relief from them to try out different ways um, of doing this. Policy prototyping, on the other hand, allows for regulatory experimentation where no such law yet exists, and when we're trying to build a new regulatory framework altogether, rather than trying to update an existing one to accommodate a new technology. Therefore, they're less formalistic, and they don't uh, necessarily take a piece of existing le legislation and subtract provisions from them, rather, and crucially, they may even add and co-create new legal or proxy legal provisions that can help inform the lawmaking process. And at Facebook, we've been implementing policy, prototype, pro, pro, policy prototyping programs through our Open Loop initiative in order to help inform how policy around things like AI can be co-developed and tested and adopted on a global scale. And the aim here is to create a robust collaborative feedback loop, i.e. an open loop, of practical learnings between the people who make the policy and then the people who have to implement it to make that policy effective in its goals. And we've been running open loop policy prototyping programs in Europe and in India and Singapore, and most importantly for this audience in Latin America, co-creating and testing these governance frameworks and largely focusing on topics such as AI transparency and explainability, risk assessments and fairness, amongst others. Um, open loop takes, as I was mentioning earlier, an experimental and interactive approach but this time it's similar to how technology itself is built. So it has an alpha stage in which to research and test different regulatory pathways that you may have come up with, and then beta phases to then iterate and refine those frameworks so you can share them a bit more broadly. To give you a bit of a concrete idea of what this means, it's all easy to be talking about this in the theoretical um, space, but you know, quite crucially it is, I can, I can explain this in four phases. One is a consortium, a conglomerate of policymakers, uh, regulators, people from the industry um, and experts in whichever area it is that you're doing these prototypes in. They'll come up with a text or a, a something in which that we can test how might explainability be done in practice, for example. And these prototypes are tested and evaluated under the real world conditions under existing um, regulatory frameworks by collecting part, uh, information from participants as they apply these frameworks to their specific products and services. And then by asking questions about how clear, applicable and effective these policy prototypes were, we can learn about their effects, their strengths and their limitations. Um, these lessons are applied and learned and shared by everyone so that they can iterate and improve on them and build a much better policy um, prototype. And then the final stage of this is to bring all of that together in an evidence-based policy recommendation so that policymakers can learn from the findings of the programme and from the feedback that was collected. Now, we run an open loop in Mexico at the beginning of the year. It's our first programme in the LATAM region and the third programme that we have launched after Singapore and in Europe. And the specific objectives in Mexico were to test and co-create policy provisions on the topic of AI, transparency and explainability, and to be able to propose a balanced and operational framework to the topic um, and, and, and use that as a stepping board to be able to establish a blueprint for future AI regulatory proposals in the region, for example, soft or hard laws, to preempt unfeasible and ineffective provisions so that we can offer a framework that is effective from the get-go. And in this program, over a period of six months, we had 10 participating companies from across um, sectors such as logistics and finance, healthcare, legal, education and GovTech. And we invited them to um, test the policy prototype on transparency and explainability on their own products and services, figure out their own ways and solutions as to how they would possibly and potentially implement this in their services, and then use the learnings they may have had um, successes, but also crucially the challenges so that we can then refine this method to come up with a way which works across different sectors. 
this uh, this in this policy prototype in particular, this open loop iteration, there's been a huge emphasis on partnerships. Um, we worked with CMINES, which is Open Loop's main implementing partner and local think tank and action bank in the field, the Inter-American Development Bank, the IDB Lab, and in I, the Mexican DPA, who were our um, regulatory partner. And we also, as I mentioned earlier, took in advice from experts from the region on matters um, to do with digitalization and regulation and data protection, compliance, and of course, from the startups. So to sum what we learned from this, well, the final program and the policy report are currently underway and, and, and being written. Um, and um, INI will be hosting the Global Privacy Assembly in October. So they may, they may well, well speak about their experience there. So you can hear it from the horse's mouth what that experience was like. But in the closing session that we had in August, companies described the, the participation in Open Loop as uh, a process of rich learnings from which they could go from the theory of what explainability and transparency, for example, was to the practice of it, learning along the way, practically how they would start to implement this. And this was by far our biggest consortium working together um, under the banner of Open Loop. And I hope that we established an important anchor point regionally for AI policy and legislation um, to hold and, and start a discussion about how we can have innovative ways to test existing legislative frameworks and trying to understand what sounds um, great in theory and in principle and how we can actually implement that in practice for it to be effective in what we are trying to achieve with making sure that artificial intelligence is developed and deployed responsibly and fairly. Thanks. Uh, Danilo is speaking, but his microphone is off. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now closing the first round of the panelists, I would like to open uh, for also a first uh, round of Q&A. We had already some questions and I'm going to uh, make them. There are three questions, basically. I would read the questions. We have three and then we have the answers. The first one goes to Jacqueline Conker. Reginaldo's question. What investment plans for development innovation parks, especially for artificial intelligence, will this increase or decrease in the next year? Second question. Uh, it's an acronym, and the question is for everybody. Should we have uh, artificial intelligence apps where we have obligatory, mandatory um, risk assessment reports? Uh, in the Brazilian legislations, are there defined uh, sectors with higher risk or not? If we don't have it, should this be a goal? Last question from Helena Matos. In which city will be the Metro pilot project? I think it's Sao Paulo, so I can answer you. And her question is, what are the plans for civil society participation? Now I'll use my privileges as moderator uh, and direct the question to everybody. But this so were the first remarks. Everything was excellent. So this uh, shows the success of uh, the initiatives. But we see that there are, there are tensions considering development and using artificial intelligence. Especially mentioned where the regulatory sandboxes, we don't uh, have a translation in Portuguese, so we also say sandbox. And the question is, considering both the beginning developing phase of the regulatory environment, but also the risks involved in 
using artificial intelligence, what would be the tools, the instruments we should use when we work with regulatory sandboxes so that they will uh, drive innovation and not hinder innovation and that the, the risks are aligned, that we have risk mitigation. Some of the risks were mentioned. So it's not just about data protection uh, because this is a risk, but also you have the freedoms, the autonomy, and um, this might be touched upon by artificial intelligence. So the question is how to make best use of the sandboxes now, maybe we could uh, begin with Jacqueline Conker. I would uh, like to say that Jacqueline Conker had to leave our session because she had an other urgent meeting. And I would like to stress that we will have uh, 10 minutes for our Q&A session and then 20 minutes debate at the end. At the beginning, we had some technical issues, so we will um, have uh, now 10 minutes for all our speakers and then 20 minutes at the end. So we can also um, express your own opinions about the questions and what the other speakers mentioned. So please, let's see, he would like to start, who would like to answer. Maybe you could use the function of raise hand function from Zoom, or if not, you just raise your own hand, whatever. Please don't be shy. As I would also like to underline why we are so proud of our conference of today. You must have noticed that this is one of the first sessions about artificial intelligence. And we have... Uh, we have for the first time uh, the special rapporteur from the UN and it's a woman and we have many women speaking about artificial intelligence and uh, this is uh, good and new especially for Latin America and Brazil so this is uh, a reason to be proud because here we are innovating. Uh, well, I'm speaking maybe too much, but we have one raised hand. So this is Viridiana, please. Good afternoon to everybody. Real quick, I also would like to thank you for the opportunity. I would like to comment the question of the um, new law just approved in the Congress and the draft is not as the proposal of the European Union for high level uh, risk systems and to have a definition, but have a guideline on uh, risk-based systems. So we have a discussion in the European Union if it should this should be the main regulatory approach for artificial intelligence system if it should uh, eminently be based on risk assessment or if it also should be solid considering respect of human rights or the impacts on human rights. Uh, one of the organizations working with this is Access Now and Danilo's question, how should we deal the uh, different regulatory sandboxes and really um, make best use of them uh, considering the rights? 
the freedoms, autodetermination, and also um, consider from the beginning all the impacts on human rights by this uh, experiment in the sandboxes, in all the tests. If this also should be one of the central pillars, how these systems are developed. If this is the approach where the impacts are considered and uh, that the rights are protected and uh, I will also talk about this in my presentation, giving you more details about the data protection laws and the regulation. Yes, I would like to ask you another question. And it goes to all of you. A concept we find and hear a lot in all the discussions about artificial intelligence. It's always there. It's so to say a meta concept. It's ethics. The Brazilian uh, law stresses uh, the necessity of uh, considering ethics. It's an abstract concept because uh, ethics, it's something heterogeneous, it's subjective, it's difficult to implement. So I would like to ask all the speakers, how do you see this? If we think about the, the practicality, what does it mean, ethics in artificial intelligence? How should we implement it? How should it be controlled? What should the regulator do or what authority should be responsible for this? I think Farzana, please, you have the floor. It's difficult. Yes, and we always have to delay the translation. Yes, please. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I think it's um, uh, a really good point about um, the ethics of it and also a really good point made previously about um, what it means to have um, a risk-based approach. So sort of taking both of them together and then looping in also of policy prototyping. Let me see if I can do justice to three different things in the same go. Um, you know, I think with the risk-based approach here, it is a really interesting approach because it goes back to a point Jacqueline was making earlier that there are of course um, things about artificial intelligence when it is deployed and used that we don't know yet in terms of the risks involved and there are some potential negative consequences but there are also incredibly beneficial aspects to using artificial intelligence and there may be um, an imperative to um, use artificial intelligence rather than uh, not use it in those instances. I'm thinking about in certain um, healthcare instances, for example, and in certain everyday uses um, to do with um, basic productivity. AI, as you just mentioned, Luca is used in almost every facet um, of our life today. So there has to be a balance between the things that are really gonna cause harm in society between those things which are kind of everyday um, occurrences. And in order to not stifle innovation in those instances where um, AI can have huge benefits for society, for industry, for governments, for all sort of sectors and of, of users and developers, we have to implement a system which takes into consideration that the most onerous obligations of any regulation would apply only in those high risk um, systems so as not to stifle um, that regulation. Um, and I think you yourself mentioned earlier, Luca, about um, the potential and um, Jacqueline too for self-regulation, but there is an interesting balance to be made there. And I think policy prototyping does that really well in that we are taking uh, in this method existing uh, regulatory frameworks, as I mentioned, and then trying to find where the gaps may be when new technology is added, such as AI, and figuring out a way in which this brand new ecosystem that we're all a part of at this moment in time, we can figure out a system, a method, a process by which to not impose 
lots of different laws which may not be harmonized but actually use what we have already that has been working and add to that different instruments that we may use some of this may be soft law it may be governance it may be um, publishing um, principles by a, a body which people respect and want to follow and it may also be in some cases figuring out which ones are the highest risk um, cases and then um, regulating on those cases only so it would propose um, a, a combination of different efforts at which to ensure that both the risks are mitigated but also the benefits are allowed to be realized Now, we give Anna the floor. Her hand is raised. And maybe then we move on to the next round. Please. Excellent question. It's difficult to find the right balance. And the areas that we should uh, allow and the ones where we should have, uh, should be forbidden. Let's think about the Euro Chamber. Here we have four stages. What is an inacceptable risk? It is artificial intelligence systems that threaten life, uh, security, and safety of people. So this means this is a prohibition, but not a specific prohibition, but you have strict obligations like risk assessment, uh, result uh, tracing, detailed reporting, control, human control. So some steps are clear, others are not. When we speak about data protection, the cases that are clear, they follow one line. And the ones that are in the middle, they should be handled on a case by case. Um, approach. But your question is really good. We should think some more about this. Yes. So we will uh, continue, not just in our next session, but uh, in the next uh, meetings, the next uh, conferences. This is uh, a topic uh, that will uh, need further analysis let's move on and then uh, wrap up our discussion so now we will have uh, the next uh, speakers uh, karen duki viridian almonte and then nina da Aura. karen duki works for google public policy brazil it's a pleasure to have you here today and you have the floor Thank you, Luca, for the invitation. Good afternoon to everybody. I'm Karen Duke, as Luca mentioned. I'm public policy manager and uh, government relations of Google in Brazil. I thank uh, Luca and FGV Foundations, and I say hello to all my panel colleagues. It's nice to see so many women participating in such a high level event and discussing such an important aspect. Our opinion, our vision is in line with what we heard here today, the good usage of the technology, of artificial intelligence. This will bring about innovation and uh, this will help us uh, fulfill our mission. So it, we have access for everybody, but we know, we are aware that there is a potential, a huge potential for society, for people that uh, 
we might establish or increase, but we also share many of the uh, worries that were expressed that this technology has some challenges we have to deal with, we have to think about, we have to find answers. And one of the challenges is about privacy. I think this is in the center of our discussions. One important message, and I have been thinking about this since the onset of the pandemic. Um, it's not uh, concepts that are against each other. They might be complementary. So I'll give you an example from Google, which explains it well. Probably you all know or heard about Google Assistant. It's our virtual assistant. We have it available in many hardware. It was uh, developed for those who use our products. It was developed with lots of tests and we center on three important principles. The first one is to keep the user data secure. Second, they must be dealt with in a responsible manner and the user should be able to control it all. So Google Assistant was projected to wait. Just wait in the waiting mode till it is activated. For example, you give a command for the appliances um, in your homes, I had to deactivate mine because if not, it would uh, intervene. So you have a button and you can silence the appliance because you can interact with it. Our cell phones, uh, you have this same mode, the assistant might be activated or not. Another important aspect is the standard is that we don't keep the audio data of our users. So the recordings are not kept. You can keep them, you can select your setting. And of course, the recordings could help us develop, improve the product. But uh, by default, this is the standard. You don't need to choose and select this option. So you are in control. It's your data. It's your choice. So we believe that the user is able to select the right things for him or her. So the user can decide what he or she might want to activate to personalize, customize the experience. So you can keep the audio recordings or not. And other important aspect that I would like to stress that every day, 20 million people visit the Google account to revise their privacy settings. Over 100 million uh, change their settings, their privacy settings. And thinking about the user empowerment, empowerment and our assistant, you can delete all your data. Just tell Google, delete everything for the last week, the last month, etc. You can also define um, data that should be deleted automatically. You can adjust the sensitivity so to avoid uh, unintentional activations so the assistant should not interact and uh, it answers. So you can modify the sensitivity. And another recent announcement that we did that reinforces our concern with privacy is the visiting mode, which is a privacy control that is very simple, very easy of home devices. You just say, okay, Google, 
activate visiting mode and all the interactions that you will have from then on will not be saved on your Google uh, account. So with this mode activated, you can use all the resources of the assistant, ask questions, control your house devices, your intelligent devices, and you reproduce uh, songs and no personal result will be disclosed. Your list of uh, commitments or your contacts, nothing of these will be disclosed while this mode is active until you deactivate this mode. The Google Assistant in our vision is uh, the confirmation that uh, privacy and uh, artificial intelligence can live together peacefully and generate more efficient and safe experiences to the users at the end of the day. And now go, going to the conclusion of uh, my presentation, another example where these uh, complement each other is uh, the 21 law project of 2020 that creates uh, the legal framework uh, and was approved this week. And this project includes a uh, safety, privacy and data protection as a basis for the development of artificial intelligence in Brazil and brings as uh, a fundamental uh, the articulation with the other frameworks that already exist and repeats the need of harmonization of this legal framework of artificial intelligence with our general law of data protection that we know is a legal framework that receives many compliments uh, domestically and internationally. So here in Google, we developed a principles for the development of AI, and these principles define our commitment in developing this technology in a responsible way, and also establishing specific areas of application where we are not going to work. And principle number five is to include privacy by design principles in our products of AI development. We include uh, our principles of privacy in the development and use of artificial intelligence tools. We give opportunity of notification and consent. We encourage uh, safeguards and privacy. We provide transparency and control that are adequate for the day use of data. Privacy is a challenge, no, co no question in AI development, but is an essential point to develop it with responsibility. And the most important message, the core message that I would like to leave with you is that according to our opinion, they do not uh, come in opposition. They are partners and together they can generate safer experiences, more efficient to the end user, just like the experience of the Google Assistant that I shared with you here today. That's it. Thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you, Karen Duque. Uh, I would like to turn now the floor to our next panelist, uh, Walden Nilo. Uh, your microphone is deactivated again to introduce the next speaker. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Confirm. Can you hear me? Luca, can you hear me? I think we are having uh, some kind of an audio problem. No, yes, now it is working. Oh, okay, so thank you very much, Karen. It was very interesting. And immediately I would like to turn now uh, the floor to our next guest, our panelist, Diana Alimonti. And even before Luca mentioned that uh, this would be a panel only with women. And I would like to... Uh, a little thing when we saw that the panel had only a woman it was only after that we prepared the panel we didn't do it intentionally so we don't have any merits for that it was actually a coincidence it was a, a natural assembly of women for a panel and i'm very happy to be a part of this panel a very diana is the senior policy analyst for the Latin America, and she also works with uh, AI in uh, her doctorate's uh, thesis that she did at the University of Sao Paulo. That has been uh, a very uh, close, right, Viridiana? And I'll like to turn the floor to her. 
Thank you very much once again. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for this invitation. Congratulations for this discussion. It is a pleasure to be in this panel with women. I, without being intentional or intentionally always trying to make these discussions more diverse. And this is certainly one of the good aspects of our debates here today. And that follows uh, that line of what uh, Karin mentioned, in that sense that uh, we need compatibility of AI and uh, privacy and data protection. And in the case of thinking uh, how we can use this technology and how using it, considering that it should, uh, in the moment that it tackles on uh, personal data, it should follow uh, this structure. And in the Brazilian case, in the case of other legislations in Latin America that have a legal framework on data protection on the limits that they tackle on personal data too, being a requirement, how can this regulatory framework be used to encourage transparency, participation, and rights in the use of this system. And certainly, this is a topic that makes it very clear that the objective is to protect fundamental rights, the development of personality, and also human rights are included in the exercise of citizenship. And also a topic that was very much discussed with society, different sectors, following an experience that we already have in Brazil with uh, the civil framework of the internet and uh, with the new question, the regulatory framework that should follow the same way. There is still the challenge of making the debate around uh, this uh, PL broader, more diverse, with more debate with society, and to be present even in a note that the coalition of the rights promoted in the network here at the Illustrian Foundation in Brazil. And uh, I believe it is important to take uh, this into consideration. And in terms of the Electronic Funding Foundation, this is an, a fundamental aspect to guarantee technology. Also, we advocate uh, uh, the possibility of the users having control on the use of technology, of having access to information on how it, your data are processed. And also it's important that companies and the regulatory framework of data protection in Brazil also allow and bring elements to this and also bring more control of the users to these technologies, making them clearer based on principles and rules, duties and responsibilities of the controllers themselves, like the legitimate expectations, good faith, and a series of other principles. As, and as Karin mentioned, uh, the point of the intelligent assistance, uh, this is a point that is very convenient, a very good innovation for the lives of people. Also to have access access to a routine and to daily information in a way that other devices, of course, we have these point in different devices, but this is a service with access to many personal information, intimate information sometimes, and the legitimate expectations, the good faith, the treatment of these data according to the principles of data protection is essential. And this is important even in face of revelations that existed, but did a long time ago in 2019, that there was no so much transparency on how this uh, data were uh, treated in different companies that had intelligent assistance and that even part of uh, these uh, uh, recordings were accessed by people that shouldn't uh, be doing this. So we have uh, this uh, points related to this treatment that are essential. And then considering the Latin American context, 
about AI and the use of machine learning automated actions. It's important to mention also the use of these technologies by the government, either in public administration that is included in the law or concerning activities of public safety, uh, penal investigations that the lay the law gave exceptions to, uh, especially for this purposes, but at the same time established that they should follow the principles and uh, rights that come with the legislation and with the recognition, with the progress of the federal uh, court in uh, the studies of the, the sharing of data, their constitutionality or not, uh, uh, with uh, uh, the uh, progress in the discussion of all these actions and the recognition as a fundamental right of data protection. This has to be recognized in treating this information by the public power in this context and that the principles and rights be recognized and applied also by this understanding that the Brazilian constitution already considers a right for data protection as a fundamental right, although we still have the discussion of PEC 17 concerning the consideration of this explicit guarantee. And this is essential in general terms in the adoption of these uh, tools by uh, the government when they might uh, impact on fundamental rights. We have to think on a balance and we have to reach a balance or an evaluation on how these technologies can impact on these rights as even part of the decision and the public uh, discussion of their adoption. Um, and, uh, so this is another point that is very important. Thinking on the regulation that we have in data protection with special consideration uh, for the rights of the holder and the principles of data protection of personal data and the co-regulation structure that the general law of data protection includes, it can, it seems to me that this is a foundation that is very relevant to think in participation and transparency, even in the use and conception of the new systems of AI and machine learning, automated versions that involve personal data treatment, trying even to differentiate in layers of access to information as layers of uh, participation and the role uh, like. Uh, what are the civil uh, society organizations doing and to be an element uh, of uh, monitoring and follow up of all these technologies uh, so that we can use uh, tools like uh, information access, the right of access uh, to data thinking, how we can use information mechanisms provided by the law to move forward in the way and uh, that we can do a study uh, to understand better these systems according uh, to the guarantee of rights. And in this sense, uh, we have uh, the right to information, either general in terms of treatment, type of data that are handled, the way uh, practices used in the government activities with, in terms of personal data, automated versions, criteria and procedures used for this automated version. This can be used in terms of having information if the treatment involves a definition of profile, automated decisions, what are the categories used, why are they relevant, why are the use categories relevant for the definition of the profile, also the right of access that includes a series of guarantees and even the access to information that can explain better how a profile is created and even the right to object and to erasure. If we understand that the personal data and not only even the data that appears that is related to a person that I identified or identifiable uh, is also protected and should be considered because of the protections provided by the law. And we also can think on ways on the right of erasure uh, because it is uh, an alley in the controls of the users connected to, to what the platform can establish in terms of uh, controls, both uh, the erasure and uh, the 
consent and the possibility of revoking the consent. And then data can be used for certain treatments like uh, directed publicity or to revoke the consent in the process. And so all these points that are so important and that are present and can derive, developed uh, from the framework that we have. In addition, an important point of the decisions based uniquely in automated treatment of data, it's important for us to understand this in the LGPD as a uh, framework of the due process where we can extract uh, from its discipline in the LGPD the right to know, to, the right of understanding the, the uh, fundamentals and to ask for revision, and even understanding that decisions based not only on automated treatment that are but that are related to framework that provide guarantees of the due process either in the justice system or in the administrative process they also should take into consideration the importance of having access to these information even when uh, this information is obtained in an automated decision and even if uh, it is not automated. And to close, uh, the principles of data protection, they include important bases uh, to think of some issues that are currently in discussion. And if we think, for instance, a non-discrimination principle together with the principle of data quality and of the prevention uh, and also of the need thinking on the discussion that we are having today in terms of facial recognition that is used by the government in public spaces, uh, how much uh, this represents in terms of a vigilance or a permanent surveillance or massive of the population with intentions and aspects of identifying uh, people in addition to non-discrimination issues that are related to the discussion of the databases of the impacts in vulnerable population. These principles help us uh, to make this discussion and come to the conclusions if uh, these uses are inherently proportional or not, and if they should remain. And there are many organizations today that already are discussing and advocating this use. And this is what I had. Thank you very much. We continue with our debate. Thank you very much, uh, Veridiana. And now we will have the last presentation. And then I remind you that because we started 20 minutes late, we will give another 20 minutes at the end until 2.20. And the last presentation now is Nina Daoya, our researcher from FGV, also member of the TikTok Security Council and many other things. She has a very busy agenda and I will turn the floor to Nina. She is a data scientist and this is very relevant to our conversation today. And uh, I will give her with her last presentation uh, before we do the segment. Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. I welcome you, everybody, also my colleagues on the panel. Many events, even on a Friday, and many important issues and aspects were raised. Also, the new law that is in the House of Representatives. Now it will move on to the Senate. And I will uh, intermediate because I worked in computing and I worked with the creation of several systems, uh, voice recognition, movement detection, and the technical jargon is uh, movement uh, detection, movement of arms and legs uh, to uh, establish anxiety levels. This was interesting when I was in university and when I directed my studies to technology and ethics. So it's the critic aspect of AI and here I decided for myself that I'm someone studying 
the use of these technologies in society and thinking about the algorithms, how the algorithms will intervene in our lives. Because I believe, and it was good to hear the opinion of the other uh, speakers, because we have uh, new technologies in the society and people are worried. Civil society, especially in Brazil or in Latin America, is still trying to understand how to deal with this developments, what are the problems, especially when we start using it. Then we have all the legal aspects. We have the governmental level, all the laws and rules. Then we have the companies and then we have the society, the people that are directly touched upon and suffered the impacts and they don't know what the impacts are. So my work uh, is divided between the technical view, the technical aspects centered on technology, but also on listening the other players. So I'm very close to the civil society. I'm making this introduction so that you all understand what I'll try to explain to you. So we, if we consider the security aspect, so we have to take care of digital safety. It comes first. Nikki Spindola, a researcher, each technological innovation will have 10,000 new problems. Uh, problems we have right now or maybe in the future, in the digital world. When we talk about the digital developments and uh, we think about that a part of the society is not adapted or does not have access to this technology, we don't have to just have the technological and legal perspective, but we have to think about how will they deal with this in their daily lives. So I'm a critic, but I also see how it might help people, for example, handicapped people. In one of the deep tapes, uh, debates are participated about handicapped, handicapped people. They were not from the legal area, nor the technological. And they told me, uh, of course, you have the legal and safety aspect, but all these uh, new developments apps helped us a lot during the pandemic. So this helps us. We shouldn't have a binary stench. It's not yes or no. We have to see the context. When Veridiana um, mentioned the, the laws, the rights, and the follow-up of the new laws, and uh, I'm part of the coalition of several clubs where we discuss uh, technology and medical area. So we think and see uh, security in Latin America, and we have to see the context, how people have access to it. We have also the gender question, we have to see the biases, what's copied, what's useful, what are the recommendations. On the other hand, uh, I don't know if the assistance, as we heard about it, and when the company started to create this technology, thought about the handicapped people. Now, during the pandemic, uh, we had an abrupt change. So important aspect for me is context. And we try to understand how to intervene and uh, um, potentialize the benefits for people. And the other aspect is 
me, Nina Dor, I don't see society without technology because we have more and more technology every day. We're using technology for different purposes. This is the premise or these are the premises. This is the context. So we have to be able to handle the technology. We shouldn't exclude them. So many people just say, and I, I, I get worried, oh, we will not use this. We will not use these tools because this was created by such and such company or such and such a person. I, I don't understand it. I won't use it or understand it, but I don't want to use it anyway. And I know that they'll be, the tool will be there and it will be used and it will be disseminated. So as a researcher, and as someone who participates in taking decision, we have to review the instrument that are causing problems in society. And this doesn't mean that we stop and hinder technological development. When I saw the regulations, some of the new regulations that are out there, I participate in the uh, hearing of the House of Representatives of the new laws, the law that's now going on to the Senate. One of my um, problems was that I feel closer to the public society right now in this debate, because if not, uh, the idea might be that we are freezing development. And it's not about freezing development because the risks are there. We foresee the risks. We talked about the personal assistance, but you also have the risk of biometric data. If this data is not well organized and protected, it will uh, go to the net and it will be bad for people. So we have to think about these problems ahead. So in my opinion, because what I saw, what I have researched, especially in Brazil, at this point of time, we have to use the law. So we need the rules, but I also am critic as a researcher, we will criticize, we have to try to make suggestions. And one um, of my suggestions is uh, include civil society. Another recommendation or suggestion is not to create and develop new technologies, but uh, to to allow the research, the projects that are ongoing on AI. And my last point I would like to stress, because we also want to have time for the Q&A, our debate, it's education. I know, I'm aware of that we are talking, we're discussing, we're trying to share our different views and opinions from different places around the world and different areas, different sectors, to, so we can together find the right way for technology to the benefit for society. So I don't see another way out. When I talk to civil society, it has to go through education. In data protection and security, we have some problems. Uh, we are discussing this in Brazil right now in a society. And this is why we uh, see that the new law, the, G the RGPD, is being accepted because we had several issues, several cases. Uh, but there are some gaps. And uh, we have, on the other side, technological education in Brazil, training people that can create new technologies. And we have to uh, divide this education in people that develop the technology, but also people that are critical uh, towards the new technologies, as we have in other countries but not in the way that you have to uh, 
uh, change everything because we see now that what's happening in South Korea, this will be banned, this will be taken back. We see this in China in a certain way also in uh, the States. Uh, talking about facial recognition. Some uh, states in the US are banishing this in public uh, spaces. And um, now talking about Brazil, I don't know if this will be possible. I am in favor of some, uh, some of it, but uh, I don't know if it will be possible considering uh, the structures we have, but we, need education, especially uh, those that are not participating in the debate and that suffer abuse and uh, they tell us and uh, the researchers hear about the problem, but they see it uh, as a problem, but it's a, a, a cry for help. So we have to involve these people. We have uh, make it more inclusive. And uh, in order to achieve this, we need a reconnection with this part of society that's not debating the issues on the same level as we are. Thank you. If you expected uh, a more technological talk about algorithms, uh, this is, I'll leave this to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Thank you. Now we'll move on to our Q&A and try to recover some of the time we lost at the beginning to technical issues. We have several questions. Question from Ana Beatriz Mello. We have the right to privacy and it's understood as a fundamental right. Is this relevant for automatic data processing or not? Second question. I think this one goes directly to Karen, but you other are also open. This is from Marcel Marcel. Google ethic is the ethic of the empowered user, in brackets. So, um, now, whoever would like to start, please. Just uh, remembering everybody, the speakers from the first uh, part um, can also participate, of course. Everybody is invited to speak and comment. All the remarks are welcome. Karen had to leave. Uh, she has another commitment. It's Karen and Jacqueline had to leave. So... Um, Please, Veridiana, and all the others, of course. All the comments are welcome. Please. Thank you. Some comments to the first question related to privacy as a fundamental right, as well as data protection as an important discussion, as mentioned by many, we had an important improvement. We have now this debate in the National Congress. And here an important aspect, and we need improvement, is uh, rules, specific uh, legislation for public uh, security. And uh, we have to guarantee the right to data protection in this realm, also in public safety, in penal law, criminal law, and national uh, defense and security. This is a direct uh, consequence of the obligation of the public sector. It's a fundamental right. These are liberties, civil rights. 
So we have to really stick to the principle of data protection, the rights of the users, of the controllers, of the data processors. And this is also relevant in our entire discussion, thinking about the uses of uh, AI systems, uh, automatic processes and systems when it's used by governments, uh, and of course, the classical right to privacy, and this is directly related to all the freedoms and rights derived from this uh, protection, and that this is a fundamental, and non-discrimination, and this is also an element in the new legislation, and it applies to data protection and the criminal sphere. Here we also have to use the proper tools so we can move on. And this is not just an issue in Brazil. It applies to the whole of Latin America. So a relevant point we have to discuss and think about. Thank you. We have another question because it's possible that all the other systems of uh, artificial intelligence might be developed respecting civil rights, transparency, and the different purposes. Well, this is the goal. This is what we want to achieve. We all, there is a consensus. This is the will. This is the main objective. Anyhow, this is a really pragmatic question. Is this feasible? Can we do it and guarantee that the principle will be respected? And that this is a sort of provocation I make to you all. I don't know if we have an answer to this. I've been thinking about this. It's a reflection. It's not an answer. We are still building the definition of artificial intelligence because we have different contexts where it's used. Even the specialists, even... Um, famous researchers started to say we have to rethink the definition we conceived in the 80s when we were uh, discovering what artificial intelligence is all about. As we are still uh, creating or recreating the definition and trying to understand the impacts in different contexts, at the same time, we have to rethink the models for society and if the society is ready and prepared to receive this and do it together. Another point related to this question is how people understand artificial intelligence? Do they know what it is? Usually people think about robots speaking, walking, but you have robots without artificial intelligence. The same applies for machines. There are no smart algorithms, but you also have a smart algorithm without robots. So we have to deal with this, to present and explain artificial intelligence to people, what AI is about today. And here, I believe that the companies, especially the companies offering products, products that are used in our daily lives play an important role. And the role is, when you think about AI, you think about tools like the one we have in Google or in Amazon. So it uh, starts to be a part of people's life. It's an important participation, but I don't know if the companies want to take over this role. 
and uh, participate in this environment where we define what AI is. Any other comment about uh, this point? Because now it's 2.20, we could start our second session, perhaps. Uh, uh, Danilo, would you like to say anything? Uh, or Veridiana or Farzana, would you like to share any idea? Otherwise, we can go to the second session of today. Silencio. Uh, the silence so suggests uh, that we should go to the second session, right? I know that Maya is going to moderate the second session and she is already here with us. Welcome, thank you for your availability. So I officially declared close this first segment of this first conference uh, on AI and data protection. And I turn the floor to Maya. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Luca, very much. Can you hear me well? Yes. Well, welcome to the second session of uh, the Latin American Conference of Artificial Intelligence and Data Protection. My name is uh, Maya Levy Daniel. I'm a researcher at the Center of Technology and Society in Argentina. And I will be moderating this uh, panel about uh, how the development of AI and data protection is happening is a topic that is essential in the region, as we are seeing spe specifically in the case of Brazil in the previous session. And to start, we have some uh, very legal points. I have to read to them. Uh, and uh, this is our disclaimer. Uh, the statements expressed by the Fundação Getúlio Vargas employees and guests who take part in online in, in feeds and broadcasts represent exclusively their opinions is not necessarily FGV's institutional position. We also reiterate that everyone present here has spontaneously agreed to participate in this event and authorize the use of their name, voice, and image, as well as assigning the copyrights related to their exhibition for this broadcast, which will be enabled later on FGV's official channels. To continue with this transmission, we ask you to verbally express and signalize your agreement with this. So I ask you, please, if you can give us a thumbs up. Thank you uh, very much. And now, yes, we will go to the session itself. And uh, as we said uh, before, in the first section, we focus specifically in Brazil and the challenges that we have over there, especially with AI. But the idea now is that we talk about regulatory points in Latin America. Why, what is the role of the state in the region, in the country? Well, how are the challenges about privacy, human rights? What are the governments and uh, uh, companies doing in this sense? And uh, we can talk this for days at an end, but we have to restrict ourselves to the time that we have. So what is the program for today? We will have it in a panel. And we are going to have a first part of this session where we will hear the presentation of three of our speakers. We will have Alejandro Pizanti, who is the general director of the University of Mexico for Computer Studies, a member of, so, of ICA for Mexico, a member of the Mexican Consortium of Data Protection, we will also have Fabio Strollini, who is the executive director of the Latin American Initiative, a member of the Network for the Development of Open Data. And at the end, we will have Sasha Lanoka, who is main mediator of uh, intelligent or artificial intelligence in the future society. 
And before joining Fiota Society, Satya worked in several fintechs in Latin America and OCDE in Paris. And your work is with national law and international initiatives uh, that tackle on AI development of independent auditors and the civic empowerment platforms. In this first part, we, the speakers, will have eight to ten minutes to make their presentations, and then we will have a Q&A session about uh, all of this. And I will ask you, please, to all of you to go on sending your questions uh, in the chat. In the second part, we will see the presentations of Altura Muente Coigame, more than 20 years of uh, experience in open source development. She works uh, with the digital government, is establishing and developing policies for the public sector and the development of Latin America. And finally, we will see Constancia Lomes Mont, founded and president of Siemens, who is a group uh, of women that tackle on technology, society, and the environment. And she also was a consultant of the Inter-American Committee of Development and different uh, government with uh, technology and digital economy. So these are our panelists and finally we'll have an open Q&A session that will be a little bit uh, more uh, extended than the, what we had before. So I will turn the floor to Alejandro Pizanti so that he can start our discussions. Alejandro, perfect. Gracias. Eh, muy buenos eh, tardes. Creo que ya son tardes para casi todos los presentes. Thank you very much and good afternoon to all attendees. It's always a big challenge to be able to speak with so many different countries, different time zones and different languages. It is a pleasure to welcome you. I thank Luca Deli for the invitation. It was an honor, or it is an honor, to be here. I am surrounded by experts that know much more uh, than I, but uh, we also here uh, have uh, problems that are similar to all of us and the strategic issues. The word AI, artificial intelligence, make us remember a series of images uh, and everything that human beings uh, uh, create. Uh, and uh, they make them uh, very uh, strong and uh, they open to us new opportunities and hear realities uh, like myths and fears that sometimes are exaggerated by the public and do not allow us to focus deep on those problems that are uh, more important. There is a different development in the region. You know this sometimes better than we do. And all in Latin America, we have a heterogeneity in the countries uh, and we see people that are in different levels. Some are leaders, uh, others uh, that develop a lot with AI. And, uh, and the same thing uh, is the ethical thought, uh, a regulatory thought uh, to get as, for instance, uh, the studies of Ricardo by Sarget, uh, where we see the different levels of uh, biases that we find materialized in this arena. Some of these are included in the arbitrary decisions that human beings could be making with their natural intelligence, national emotions and their daily activities of every day, and also produce several uh, roles and aspects. There is a very intense development in artificial intelligence that is not easily recognized as by the academia, by the regulating bodies uh, on other arenas. Uh, several young peoples in Latin 
Latin America. They are very good developers of SAF software, and they are adopting those artificial intelligence uh, tools uh, spontaneously, in addition to tools uh, that they can use with these models that come from different sources. And being very spontaneous, we are talking about a group of two or three uh, developers that work in uh, tools, and Constance uh, told me that were installed with uh, these people and uh, they develop applications uh, for cell phones so that they can read the very small print that are in some documents or in some uh, instruments and we know and we, what is the algorithm that they did, what the update is that they did, uh, but uh, they used a database that brought images and brought such a perspective that has to show to you and uh, show to us that we have uh, to encourage them. We have to uh, provide them the possibilities of having a, a more formal education. We have to send them to school. We have to make them to contribute to a system and to dedicate themselves more to everyone. And also Luca asked us to talk about what is being the global participation of AI or the Global Alliance for Artificial Intelligence, of which I have been invited as a governmental member and by the Mexican government that is also a participant of the GPAI. And they gather together some of the best experts, best known as some uh, that come from a country that uh, are the GPL, like Ricardo, and uh, that are working about uh, topics uh, related to AI and uh, data governments. In, yeah, and within this group, there is a very interesting study called the Data Crossing, which is the capture of data. People spontaneously, they project uh, an organization that is going to be the responsible for the use of our data. And we are going to provide a limited or restricted authorization concerning a possible use of our data uh, in artificial intelligence. And this is very interesting. There is a group of work that is uh, focused on the discovery of uh, pharmaceutical medications and their guidelines is to use open science uh, data sharing and uh, the survey of restrictions for data sharing focused in uh, research and development of uh, pharmaceuticals, the biological evidence that should exist to corroborate this. And in a third point is that, uh, as you well know, I come from the governance world, internet governance. I work with national and international organizations and uh, about hyper security. Also, we are in a very special moment where the companies, uh, especially uh, when it uh, concerns AE and others, that uh, they are working uh, strenuously on that and all the algorithms, all the automation, all of that uh, is trying to show that nothing needs to be regulated here. And in face of the possibility that uh, there are regulatory frameworks, they want a self-regulation. And each company and our opportunity as the academia, our golden opportunity is to make this a decision uh, that uh, can allow us to have multi-sectorial tools that do not remain only on the hands of the state, uh, but that also civil society can be involved in this arena. It is the same uh, that happened uh, 25 years ago when Dominion names appeared, ICA and others uh, were created with a multi-sectorial intervention that I consider that 
are very important, although they are not free from problems. And if all, if after all these years, the regulation of the economics and ecological effects of the, envir the environmental pollution was discussed at the time, uh, the industry which said nothing's happening, is nothing going to happen, don't worry, nobody needs uh, to uh, be concerned, uh, we are going to do the right thing. But when they understood that there was going to have a regulation, they started acting, probably with AI. We are following these same steps. We are not going to regulate before we become productive and competent with a competency and a productivity that can make us really relevant. Uh, thank you, Alejandro. Fabricio. Hello. Okay. Yes, I can. Can I continue now and do my presentation? I am talking from Uruguay and I will try to share my screen. So, let's put it in the presentation mode. And this presentation that I'm going to share with you, and I I would like also to thank the invitation uh, to this event. What do we know about policies and practices concerning AI in the public sector of Latin America? I'm going to explain what ILDA is, which is an international organization that is focused in generated evidence to solve the most relevant problems in Latin America based on the ethical use of data, the co collaboration and inclusion. And in this case, in particular, we prepared a project with uh, different uh, organizations associated to this project. This project is called Empatia, and it tries to, to explore the use of a series of uh, techniques in the public sector. Here you can see the list of organizations that we work with, uh, the IRC, IDRC Center, or CRDI, and with our colleague Maya, in part of this uh, project. And uh, uh, here uh, we can see where we are located in Latin America. Uh, this is the global uh, rate or global ranking for the preparation of the adoption of AI in the world. And this already is going for two years. The darkest the color of a country, more prepared this country is. Uh, the ranking uh, was uh, produced uh, to support uh, DRIC. And you can see that here we don't find any Latin American country with a dark color. This is because of a series of methodological points. Uh, but what this map showed is that uh, the so-called AI revolution was not reaching Latin American countries and the Caribbean because they were not prepared to it. And this uh, rose our interest, but even more, what was happened with uh, the public sector and the state? Basically because the state continues the developing actions that are essential actions in Latin America. They are the major stakeholder when we establish the limits and for economic development. So we have to ask, who is doing what? Does it work or doesn't it? On one side, we try to understand what we had in regulatory terms in Latin America. And uh, here, I am going to talk about uh, uh, an anecdote uh, uh, that the previous colleague mentioned. 70 proposals were introduced for all Latin America to solve public problems uh, using AI. A very interesting case because basically it was created a risk calculator to identify chronic disease. Uh, this was prepared by a startup in Mexico called Prosperia and Bruce Perrier uh, was uh, following this process 
and uh, this kind of uh, calculator collected uh, information that came from the United States and generated several results. Uh, and in this case, we use data from Mexico, data that were adjusted to according to the conditions of the country. And for the first time, the users of this system and potentially any person that had interest could have their risk assessed be considering their group of reference because the information was obtained over there. So the people said, well, I am first going to download a tool to generate a certain model, but if the information uh, doesn't come from the right place, we are going to create uh, not very good images and we are not going to create uh, tools of quality. In this case, uh, people have to know what the risks that they run. We have several projects uh, ongoing with Colombia, Brazil, Argentina, and so on to increase transparency in a number of applications where you can use machine learning in the public sector. I would like to show you some concrete examples. So we found in this project the following results. Considering policies, we have several challenges. We have different strategies. Due to time constraints, I'll try to be short, so we'll still have time for the discussion. So we have a variety of strategies in Latin America. This is not reflected in the understanding so that we have a clear vision of the strategies. We know from the colleagues that we should first define what is the strategy, what is AI. Many, many countries talk about strategies. Uh, it might be a declaration of intention. It might be a business plan. Um, so it depends. If I should define it, I think only two or three countries, we don't have mature strategies in Latin America, and the investments are far from what is invested in other countries. So there were several attempts with limitations, different private companies uh, tried projects, achieved good results, and um, linking to what was said by the colleagues, we might have um, rights, but what does not exist are clear, uh, a, a clear legal frameworks, because uh, the algorithms, machine learning is important, but here we also have to consider data protection. If we want to work with IA and where we have empathy. You use public data, but you also use private data in some projects. So it becomes clear. If you don't have clear definition, a clear devenance, we might have the tools, but we don't uh, have total uh, transparency and clarity about the data that is used. Sorry about the noise in the background. What we also realized that uh, we have different capabilities in Latin America, thinking about the development of the strategies and their implementation. Some countries are developing other priorities. This is not their priority, but this is very dangerous because we might focus on connectivity, on one hand side, but we should not ignore what the private sector is doing, is implementing worldwide. We have machine learning, private data. 
personal data. So you might have huge ambitions considering artificial intelligence, so you can't just ignore it. What we see is that we have a great variety in the public sector. The tools used are different, so we don't have uh, really sophisticated, sophisticated applications in the public sector, but also the data infrastructure is an issue. Who is taking over the leadership considering the projects? Not all the projects are being implemented and controlled. Another element we discovered Regulation today is not a problem for progress and the work being carried out, but it's a issue if we think about non-public data. In this case, we have uh, several blockages. Just to conclude, I would like to share the following reflections. Data are key, but the governance rules must guarantee our liberties and rights. We need transparency and the companies must explain what they are due. If an algorithm takes a decision and I can't explain it, I have a problem. We are we live in, 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 in democracies, and so we have to think about the beneficial uses and the problems. And we should also reform our digital services. There are tools out there to use artificial intelligence, but again, we are fighting digitalizations. And uh, this also shows us that we could help excluded people, marginalized people, but there are gender questions uh, that are not considered by the databases and the tools. So with this backdrop, I would like to conclude my reflections and I would like to invite you all that we can meet again uh, in the context of this project uh, to continue discussing and uh, learn more about the examples in Latin America. And I thank for the opportunity and that's it. And uh, awaiting the discussion. Thank you, Fabricio. We'll come back to these reflections during our debate. Now we have uh, Sasha Alanonka. This is the third presentation of this panel. Please, Sasha, you have the floor. Perfect. Many thanks, Maya. And many thanks for the Sasha to Le Vargas and, of course, CTPT Latam for the invitation. Very happy to be among you today. Um, so I'm a senior AI policy researcher at the think tank, the Future Society. We are one of the niche think tanks focusing on the social and ethical impact of artificial intelligence. And maybe to give a better illustration of our work and also how it may be relevant for the Latin region. So last year I had the chance of collaborating with the Global Partnership on AI, of which Alejandro, as mentioned, is also part. Um, and coordinate the working group on AI in pandemic response, which might be one of the use cases um, interesting for the region, of course. And then right now I'm collaborating with the governor of Tunisia to draft the AI national strategy. So just reviewing all of the national guidelines and seeing also what we can leverage and what are the main lessons learned. So happy also, you know, to see what can be leveraged um, in terms of the Latam region. And of course I have strong regional ties. Um, I am half Chilean. And uh, just before the world turned upside down, um, I had the opportunity of participating to the first AI regional forum in Latin America and the Caribbean, organized by UNESCO. Um, so that was amazing to see at the time, you know, the draft, the start of the draft of the Brazilian strategy um, and the Chilean one, and to see, you know, how the efforts have come so far. So today, I think I would like to articulate the presentation 
around two main axes, but she's taking into account uh, the short time and to make sure we have room for discussion. Uh, first of all, it would be interesting, you know, to have a Zoom on the potential use of AI uh, in pandemic response, and especially at what can be relevant for the region. And then I think, you know, when you look at those use cases, especially the use of AI uh, in healthcare, you get a really good illustration of what are the potential opportunities, but also the potential risk and the main challenges. And when we'll zoom in on the challenges of the use of AI in the healthcare sector, it will re rejoin a lot of the challenges encountered um, by the adoption of AI tools also across the region. And I think this will be a good, you know, uh, transition towards the second axe, which is more of what are the lessons learned from past AI national strategies, both LATAM and worldwide, and how we can, you know, leverage those lessons in order to also have a coordinated voice uh, across the region and enable this Latin voice uh, to shape the global AI agenda. So without any further ado, I have um, also a presentation, but I thought it was nice also to uh, not use the notes straight away. So I will, I will share the screen uh, when necessary. So um, of course, you know, as uh, Fabricio and uh, Alejandro rightly pointed out in the two previous presentation, there are many potential benefits for the use of AI in the region. Uh, some of them, of course, you know, are used to, um, well, have to be adapted for each country, but I think some common trends can be, of course, in the sector of education. Um, some have Chilean, and I always follow, you know, like I, mean, I live there also, uh, closely follow uh, politics, and it's of no surprise that Chile has gone, you know, in the past few years through, the, through an incredible amount of social unrest. Some of them, you know, uh, linked to um, broader socioeconomic challenges, but a lot of them also linked to the cost of the higher education system, which is considered to be the second most expensive in the world after the United States. Um, and so, of course, you know, some AI uses in uh, the field of education to make it more affordable, more accessible, have always been uh, on the agenda. Some other potential uses, and this is where I'll zoom in, is how AI tools can be leveraged in the healthcare, and especially in the context of a pandemic. And for that, um, it would be useful, you know, to refer to uh, the work we have done with GPI, so the Global Partnership on AI, where um, last year I had the pleasure with a working group of mapping about a hundred AI initiatives worldwide, which were being used to fight against the pandemic, but also which could be transferred to potential future pandemics. And in this context, we we're able to uh, map those initiatives, shortlist the most promising one, but also identify what were the common challenges and what were the best recommendations that governments, but also uh, stakeholders across society could give to be able to improve them. And maybe now is the moment to share my screen. <laughs> so here, for example, you know, I think it's um, always better to illustrate um, with some potential use cases. When we speak about the use of AI in the healthcare sector uh, and in the context of a pandemic, the way we have used to map those tools is across three different categories. The molecular one, which is, you know, in the context of the pandemic was really a lot linked to better understanding COVID-19, the protein, but also to be able, you know, to um, test some potential vaccines. The clinical field, where, for example, you can have some scans of the lungs of potential pa patients, and with AI-powered tools, you can improve the diagnosis to make a more efficient and quick decision. And of course, the social field, where here you have um, some things linked to epidemiology, epidemiology, um, anti-vaccine, of course, like studies included into that. And when it comes to Latin America and our mapping, there was clearly a deficit of some regions around the world and the initiatives were able to map. Part of it, is due to the lack of information online, which I think was a common trend across a lot of the initiatives, because a lot of the people were actually working on developing the tool rather you know, than putting information online. So this was definitely one of the constraints. But some of the most relevant tools we found in the case of Latin America were particularly linked to CT scans. And um, one notable one, which we shortlisted were in Mexico and in Brazil. Uh, in Brazil was RADVID-19. Um, and both of the Mexican and Brazilian initiatives were basically using city, school, city tools powered by AI uh, and implementing them across hospitals and clinics in order to ease uh, the practitioners, doctors, evaluation of patients and to see whether these had to stay under observation or not. 
when you know looking at some of the main challenges those are the common challenges that we can also find you know throughout most of the regions around the world there are the ethical and legal barriers as fabricio and alejandro rightly pointed out before and especially in the case of the pandemic and data which are sensitive the lack of a global health data governance framework access to reliable data that have quality, especially in this case, this is heightened by the fact that this was a new virus, which we had very, very like lack of information. And the third point where I would like to emphasize on is the lack of public adoption and credibility. We're evolving in a situation of heightened public mistrust. And um, when you have a context of a pandemic and you put the, world, the word AI together, you create a double defiance from the population. And so what is interesting is that when you analyze a lot of the AI national strategies so far, a lot of them, you know, do some sectoral analysis. Um, so, you know, try to see where it could have the best socioeconomic impact. But we tend to put on the second round, on the second level, how to create public engagement, endorsements and adoption. And um, very briefly for the sake of time, I will go through this slide, but it's just to uh, show, you know, the timeline and all of the past lessons also we can leverage. So just Mexico uh, leading the way. And I know that now we have furthermore countries, um, Argentina, Colombia, now Brazil also publishing its strategy and Peru, Chile soon. Um, but just to emphasize sort of three points and happy also to debrief this later um, with the panel and the participants. I think that some of the key lessons, especially in the context of the pandemic, and especially in a, in a scenario of high political volatility, is how to ensure public trust and AI adoption. Because we keep on speaking, you know, about um, potential AI benefits, but if at the end no one is adopting those new tools, whether it's in the public or private sector, this is not going to have an impact. And so I think here we can really, really gain some inspiration from the Chilean context and the high level of political participation they have uh, implemented in their methodology, where they had different roundtables with citizens, uh, self-organized roundtables, public consultation also made online to make sure that there was public awareness and public endorsement. And I think this is really something that now we should uh, think of more automatically when building a country's um, AI national strategy or you know, updating it. The second aspect is really to ensure there's an implementation plan. And I think into the recently published uh, report of the Inter-American Development Bank, they highlight, for example, the case of Colombia. And it's true too often we have, um, you know, sweat analysis of the country's strengths, weaknesses, etc. We have sectoral, you know, approach, but we don't have clearly defined roles on who will implement this. So I cannot emphasize enough how much this has to be a key part of it. And the last point is maybe you know how can we be one step ahead what you know can we leverage from past strategies but also the recently um, released eu aa act to ensure to be one step ahead and maybe one way of doing so is that we have a lack of regional and national understanding of ai application and ethical stakes there is a clearly like this is dominated by western voices there is a lack of you know different regional and national voices being heard on it and so when we have different categories of AI application, the high risk, the minimal risk, the medium risk one, this, of course, you know, is different according to the different regional context. And so I would encourage AI national strategies also to take this into account and to define it per national and regional context. And I will stop here to leave room for discussion. Many thanks, Maya and the team. Thank you, Sasha. Okay, I believe that we can go to our first uh, break of presentations, and perhaps we could start with two questions, right, that are somewhat related, and uh, they have, they are connected with all the points that was mentioned. The first question might be, how can we do to regulate AI without uh, preventing progress or hindering innovation and protecting uh, privacy at the same time? Could it be through AI strategies? Could it be through uh, regulation? What is your opinion about this? Do you have any examples that you could share 
in your region, of course, uh, you know, considering the specific conditions of each country. The second country, the second question, sorry, might be uh, the current discussions about the regulation of AI as an issue are taking place in Europe and they are based on the AI risks, that is. Theoretically, it's reasonable, but is it possible to define very clearly the risks of, of artificial intelligence? And if it is possible, who should be doing it? So these are different aspects we know that can be included. So Arturo, Constance, and if you want to participate, you're welcome. So Alejandro. I always ask myself uh, who likes to regulate? Because the first uh, Latin American answer that comes to my mind, uh, the statements that I hear, I, well, we have to regulate. In the case, what? What is the layer? Is it artificial intelligence? Are these specifications that we are developing? This is a layer, that which is the algorithm, another layer, the data themselves that are underlaying. And this is the other one that tells us where we're going to applicate uh, this uh, thing. The Bicechet model is a kind of the onion with different peels that we have to remove. We don't need to regulate to solve all the things, but this is one of the points that come when we talk about this. We could have a framework including an ethics and accountability with us, different ethics actually, but they should all focus on the accountability to break down the problem in the different parts how several elements uh, that are always mentioned uh, are uh, systems uh, that can be used, like the United States use them, and uh, they are even uh, present terms that are made or that are given in a wrong way uh, to punish uh, very uh, violent offenses. So in what moment should we place a human evaluator in place of an artificial intelligence system? Which of them would bring fewer bias effects? Now that we know that these effects exist, that this system, this complex system of software is acquired by a public employee, a, a committee of purchasing, somebody from the judiciary power. Now that we can have and that we know these uh, biases affect, when a uh, tender is made, we can specify that uh, discriminatory effects should be present. But how can we evaluate these? How can we evaluate if a system is not discriminatory? And today we discuss very much that we have a database where artificial intelligence and an algorithm can be calibrated and then we can demonstrate if they are meeting or not this discriminatory criterion. So, it is necessary to find ways of measuring and calibrating all of this. And all these elements must take into consideration the uh, proportionality. The person who is in in charge of acquiring a system that is discriminatory, either to solve the different problems or not, must uh, have a responsibility as a public servant, and this must be included in the law. In the case of uh, companies, the consumer uh, with civil responsibility, we can even go to extremes. Civil responsibility could be turned into a penal responsibility. And this is a framework that allows us to examine and list the major principles uh, through which 
uh, we can build the more than 1300 ethical codes of AR that already exist and bind them uh, to practices. But the question is, uh, who should regulate and uh, how the regulation uh, should be our last resource, not the first? Anybody else, uh, Fabricio? Well, usually I share uh, Alejandro's ideas when he mentions uh, uh, non-regulating just by default. That is uh, to be the first thing to be done. We should regulate actually based on all the evidence that we have. And it is here that things become more complex because we have evidence of a major proliferation of ethical codes, but uh, with uh, a very bad application. And especially in, in some uh, places, apart from the companies that uh, are present also in their development. So here we are facing a problem that uh, impacts the, not the sector public that Alejandro mentioned. There are people prepared, models that have been developed, how you are going to hire this kind of projects. In all this sense, here in Uruguay, uh, the uh, collaboration uh, with our Chilean colleagues, so we are making a design for a model of tenders, how to provide tenders so that uh, when state in, embeds these technologies, they also have criteria for their use and can see if they work or not. Most of them are in the experimental stage, especially in terms of the application for the public sector. Many promises, but we have to confirm that all these promises can be met. And so I believe that here there is also one path and we will move forward in regulations. But what must be important not to forget uh, that there are general principles about uh, where we find uh, these technologies, where are they embedded, and we have to consider that they, they are part of the democratic systems and systems that allow people to complain uh, a responsibility with uh, property, uh, with the trade of the state, uh, is this something that really exists? So it will depend very much on where we are in the world, our engagement on all these activities. And I don't know very much, but possibly those colleagues that work in internet governance, they have already dealt with this kind of problem. And in certain areas, the implementation of this kind of techniques can be a little more simply. simple. For instance, the area of immigration, and uh, here things become a little more complex. And every time that a student of engineering has a good idea, ah, I'm going to need three permits so that he can develop uh, an application or, well, this is crazy. But uh, in terms of uh, principles and care on how to include this very sensitive topic, in uh, our daily routines. This is something that we have to deal with uh, in Latin America. And also we have to decide uh, how are we going to play all of this in Latin America. We can have a more marginal role or we a country or a group of countries can say, now we are going to uh, participate as users of these technologies and um, we will do a follow-up of other entities or agency can produce all the, this, the countries can also decide to, to produce uh, their own applications. And, and this uh, will turn into a challenge to the government itself and for the whole ecosystem. And for the investment the models too, there will be many questions. I also mentioned this because the regulatory aspects, they are directly connected to the capacity or investments that we have. Constanza. Well, I would like to say uh, that uh, this is a debate with a very interesting initiative, but talks in Europe based very much on human rights. 
And uh, this is uh, providing a, a north to all the conversations. It is the foundation for the new regulation that is being proposed. And so the United States, uh, they want to see the probability, they want to be more efficient, they want uh, optimization of use, and they want to use AI. I don't believe that any European system, or even in the United States, uh, are right, but we as a region, we as should uh, think on the ethos of this technology, because to decide what we have to regulate and what should be removed, what are the layers of the onion that we can peel, this will depend on the values that we are prioritizing in our region. And this question should be it's placed in its own context and locally as well. And I ask myself, as many others do, are we going deep in, on these uh, discussions and uh, who are the people that uh, are helping us to detail these topics, the uh, debates and discussions? And, and to answer this question, I know that we need two things. So we need a public uh, uh, hearing, a public debate that is generalized to show to whom these technologies are. Like this, we understand the public policies and the incentives. And in the second place, I consider that it is essential. And according to the perspective of Siemens, uh, there is a series of applications that should not be allowed. We have to identify what are the limits for Europe. They talk about the manipulation of children. Uh, that is systems that can manipulate uh, the, the definition of children. There are limits to be regulated, of course. And we also have to ask ourselves to what extent, why, and we have to decide if during the discussion what represents uh, the project, the capacity of those who are going to audit the project, what are the bottlenecks and also the biases and the structures of power that decide how everything is going to be used. So what is missing is to have this public debate, is to understand that the context of this question is much more encompassing and that we should be very clear in our explanation. Uh, thank Sorry. you, Constanza. Alejandro wants to speak again. How uh, to take these criteria to the developers, to the programmers. This is a big challenge, right? Asha? Sorry, there's a little lag each time. Uh, uh, um, I completely agree with also what Constanta has said in the sense that your question, I think, Maya, initially is how can you regulate without hindering innovation? And this is something which is very like local dependence. In the sense, it's not one size fits all, and one should be careful of not having one region dominating the debate on that. And it's not because you have the first regulatory framework. Of course, you can seek inspiration by this, but this should not be absolutely copy paste and transfer to somewhere else. And in this sense, you know, when you define what is a high risk application a minimal, uh, and a minimal one, this differs according to regions, this differs according to countries. And the way of having this consultation is, of course, by having some participatory designs across when you build your national strategy or when you update it across regional forums. So this is something like, you know, consultation, public consultation hearing is something like strongly encouraged. But just, yeah, to realize that, like there's a balance between the innovation and the regulation and that this is something which depends of your values and what you prioritize. And this is something that you can only do by listing, you know, the public and also understanding what they're willing to adopt, what they're willing to accept or not. And to your question now on who's in charge of regulating it, um, it has to come from different segments, right? It's not going to be one entity regulating everything. Once you have decided which are the use cases you want to, you know, overview the most closely, um, and especially, you know, with some ethical values which can be very technical, such as data robustness, uh, fairness also by like algorithmic bias, um, the government might not be able to do everything and you have to like differentiate between what can be self-assessed by the business, what can be do a pre-audit and what can be audited also 
or, or evaluated also by public authorities. But there's definitely also very training to be done to ensure that the people, once they'll be in charge of doing this, have the right competences to do it accordingly. Muchas gracias, Sasha. Uh, thank you, Sasha. Anybody would like to make any other question? So, Fabricio? Well, it's uh, uh, what Sasha mentioned about uh, source and uh, it's part of your question. Who regulates this? Are the agencies? Are the companies? Uh, are these interested groups? And we must have a very clear cut definition. And the, the electronic uh, digital governance entities, uh, should they take over uh, this uh, topic? Uh, should we have an ombudsman of consumers? So I believe that is possibly we are going to a phase a kind of transversal cross-cut of all these uh, points. And currently what we see is machine learning applications in general terms. And uh, this uh, will make us analyze how we are going to see all the activities with all the regulators, how they are going uh, to have uh, the capacities and skills to understand how this all this affects their work. So this is a way of avoiding over-regulation. Over this is just a first reflection. And the second reflection about this is that I believe, in general, uh, that the audits really play a role and they can even help PMEs to develop uh, this work. There are PMEs in Europe that do this kind of work and they're part of a system of regulation. And especially uh, when we are talking about more sensitive uh, sectors like education, uh, that we find benefits, of course, but many risks are involved. So, there are very interesting things in the horizon. We have to think on the role of the PMEs and uh, SMEs, sorry, that can participate on this audit and that can help uh, the auditors of those who participate on audits to do it with more uh, uh, elements. I'm just going to repeat a little bit of what Fabrizio mentioned. And adding uh, to what Sasha said, it's about balance. The fact that uh, we don't know exactly should who regulate, don't put aside the fact that regulation is necessary, right? Uh, so especially when uh, we think about a scenario where before we didn't have anything. Uh, so it is extremely important uh, that uh, we become uh, clear in all these aspects uh, that they have to be in an equilibrium. It will depend on the context. Uh, we are facing practices that go beyond territories and where uh, the borders uh, have very little meaning. And so the balance between innovation rights, essential rights, a balance of opportunities and risks between regulation and local and global aspects. All these points brings us uh, to a point uh, where we have to be uh, very open, we will have to be ready, we have to be prepared and be open to listen to the points of view of others. We have to reach this balance, but also I believe that we uh, are not like Europe, we are not like the United States, because uh, they are in very different positions. So, 
un oxímoron y hasta cierto punto creo que lo es. That perhaps all of a sudden an oxymoron appears, and I believe to be one of them, and then it brings the regulation system. But we have to know exactly who, why, what, and when. And these are questions that always have to be thought. We need to stand uh, international standards. And what Alejandro just mentioned, he knows very well the governance of internet. This is a story about this on how we can uh, create uh, rules and regulation standards. That That can go beyond borders and we will probably need something like this perhaps today is not that easy how it was done with uh, something that was uh, so new in the past but one of the things that i highlighted here is that today we have uh, more questions than answers and this is okay We don't need to answer everything, but we have to improve our questions. And perhaps like this, we can have better answers. Okay. I think that what was mentioned is really important. This is a rich discussion. We have many entities and institutions here, and they made important recommendation. But many things are not within the scope of the national governments. We have no control on Google and so on. But uh, we have uh, models when we think about China. But this is not the way we want it to go. When we think about practical lessons learned in the world, we have the Internet Alliance and the partnership, and we are solving real problems. We are uniting the appropriate stakeholder with the appropriate infrastructure. And if we have adequate flexibility, we can be realistic about it. And we can put on paper what we want and what we need. But uh, we should always be able to implement the things we define. Now we have to see the behavior, the risks, the um, barriers, reduced barriers. We have many aspects and we need a proper basis, but we need a mapping of all the elements, all the aspects, so that we don't get just one answer, one size fits all, but all the questions should be answered. Now let's move on to the second part of the presentations and then we will have another debate. Now we have Arturo Mente Kunigami, our senior specialist of the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, it's not just a presentation, it's a talk, a conversation about the equilibrium, about the balance, the space we need to discuss and to listen. I believe in the openness of data. But now we have a strong focus on data protection. There are spaces where people think this is uh, antagonic. I think there is some space between. We need both and we need interaction. And with all the questions we touched upon, during the Q&A session, I think that above all, it's the intention, the goal to learn more, to achieve more. Even if we know a lot today, uh, there's always something new. Europe is working on regulation, not just data protection, but also AI and the implied risk. So Europe, is uh, showing us the way, um, is guiding us. We don't know yet if 
what they are establishing is enough or is wanting or is too much, but it is a reference. And answering your original question, it's true. So if we are focusing on the risk, it's not wrong, but the problem is the details. So what are the mitigation measures? Who defines risk? And how should we mitigate or how can we mitigate the risks? Something else I would like to highlight and share with you what we did and what we know about this. It was mentioned that it's necessary to raise awareness, to involve people, to include society. How can we include all the functionalities to protect the privacy if people don't know and are aware of the risks they incur. We did a study with uh, over 1,500 people in uh, different countries. Everybody thinks protection is important, but yes, uh, personal data are important. Yes, why? I don't know. Is, are your personal data private? Would you share it with the government? So what we need to do is to moderate, is to talk to people so that the conscious decisions are taken, that are informed decision. Um, Alexandra mentioned the data steps. So things are happening. It's a mechanism. So you can use data, not with total control, but the better knowledge, how the data are will be used and that there are limits. So what should people do? How can they take a decision if they don't have all the information? So it's important. And many of the things that we now call artificial intelligence, this is not neuronal networks, uh, it is more machine learning. So it's data that will feed into a program, into algorithm that were created by people and this will issue a recommendation and this will lead to several decisions. So I think Alessandro tried to explain this when he mentioned the different layers. So in each phase at each moment you have might have bias. So it's decisions that affect uh, one segment of the society, maybe not the other. And you might make mistakes. There might be errors. So the bias is not intentional. It's not made on purpose. But uh, people might include something into an algorithm or exclude something. So something, the decisions, even if you have a disclaimer, exemption of responsibility, even though the recommendations are also decisions and there is no control over eventual bias that might be there. So all the AI processes that should be regulated, I don't think so, but we should stress that you have to assess the risks and know the risks and then think about mitigation steps. This is what we are doing. And the major AI initiative and Constanza will talk about this because she is participating actively in this. It's the Feralek platform.rg and they promote the responsible use of AI data. So this goes together with the question why we should motivate um, 
the responsible use because we don't want to hinder development. So we need regulation and we need to take into consideration the different defense lines. And the first one is responsible use. The second one, and maybe this is even the last one, it might be the regulatory framework for AI. Here we have different strategies. They try to push also regulation, but we also have a different approach to protect the rights. So based on the protection of private and personal data. Not all AI application affect our personal data. So this should be taken out, but we have uh, many, a lot of data from satellites and, and controllers, and it's not always about personal data. And so you should access the impact and the risk. So, of course, the region here uh, is not so developed. I've been working with 16 countries uh, within the Inter-American Development Work, and uh, we have different laws, especially for the financial sector. It's general data protection laws. Uh, within this uh, 16, only seven have specialized authorities or agents so some have established standards, they were established in 2017. So this is in line with the European regulation. Uh, and this was, uh, it was not yet published because it's being revised. So we compared the regulation and the laws of the 16 countries. The oldest one is from Chile from uh, 97. It was also modified several times, but in general, uh, the more recent the law, more adequate is considering data protection. So this is linked to digital development. We work with the authorities. Uh, and as you know, uh, we have just two countries that are considered adequate um, considering the uh, European regulation. This is uh, Uruguay and Argentina because of the Convention 108. And as Alejandro mentioned, they tried to uh, implement the law. Uh, we also did a uh, audit on algorithms. It was a social problem. There is no legislation uh, to apply uh, the algorithms uh, here in the public sector. And this is another question uh, that we had to work with this. So we have to include this and especially again, considering all the risks, etc and all the impacts and the other question that is connected here and i open a, a, a bracket and then i will add you a little bit more uh, the other question is if the public sector should open with uh, should work with open algorithm and being open uh, by exception other modalities and also uh, we have had conversations about this and i believe that this is interesting and the conclusion will be probably no but the conversation is very interesting uh, and uh, we need to find more transparency for this decision and something very briefly I'm, I'm, uh, we have worked uh, with the countries that are interested and one again, once again, with uh, general measures. And uh, these measures uh, are being implemented by each one on their own side. And 
And this is something interesting that we can have a coordination in all of these things. Um, yo lo dejo ahí. Eh, so I'll finish here. I think my time is over. Okay, now we come back to our debate. Thank you, Arturo. Now we have uh, Constanza Gomez Mont. Thank you. I was asked to talk about our work, what we have been doing. For years, we have been discussing the topic of uh, artificial intelligence. What does it mean for human rights, for society? Where is the intersection between AI, society, environment? How can we achieve a balance? So each question is really specific. Anyhow, we wake up every morning is the wish to try to understand how this new reality, the new tools that are so transformative, what is their impact for our daily lives? What's happening in Latin America? So we have to listen. We need the space for decision taking. People should be informed, but what does this mean? We need mechanism replicable mechanism. So AI, we focused especially on two questions. First, how overcome the mistrust towards this technology, which is coming so fast. To trust the technology, we need mechanisms so that we can trust this technology. So what does all this terminology mean? What's the link to democracy? And this was also mentioned, and this is central. We need the inclusion of women. We need consider gender, not just in the codes and the algorithms, but everywhere. It's the human aspect. In Latin America, new technologies are adopted. There was a study carried out. 80% of the big companies are already using AI, different modalities. And we all know that during the pandemics, uh, the new technologies accelerated. The digital transformation arrived. Uh, there is the McKenzie study. We covered uh, in few months uh, what we would have achieved in 18 years in terms of digitalization. What we see on the street and in the debates, and I think that these debates are great, and on the streets, we can't abolish the algorithm. Sometimes people don't want the algorithms, but this uh, shows that, that people are involved, are engaged. So some of them understand what the technology means, what are the consequences, but not everybody. So what are the consequences? What are the concepts? 85% of the AI projects will lead to the wrong results and they are not efficient and so on and the results are good what does that mean so if we think about the minorities or that women that they don't have access to services and if the decision based on ai take decisions who will receive government help and assistance, but it goes beyond. It's complex and the complexity has to be understood. And it's also access to rights in the broadest way. This is embedded in the AI systems. These technologies are fast. 
real fast. It's about learning in the companies, in startups, how, what should be regulated, who creates the models, who regulates public policies. And as we know, there is not enough knowledge over 175 protocols are out there. There were many initiatives for AI and uh, focusing on human rights or ethics. But when we talk about with companies, 10% of the companies or the people working there, they know about good practices, they know about transparency, but the challenge is that many of the private institutions, especially the smaller ones, they uh, are using the development of third parties from outside. This is about 40 to 70 percent. So they use this kind of system. So they don't understand how the technology provider create the AI system and what happens to the transparency. We have the technical issues, we have uh, everything centered on technology, but it's not just about technology, it's about government, it's about power, and uh, it's not just within the companies. It has to be horizontal. The decision taken must be horizontal. And uh, we have a gap between this vision and the level where this happens on the technical uh, level and on the decision taking level. So it should be horizontal and on a high level. So then we ask, what should we do when we have uh, to meet, or, or what for, or to whom, or who uh, gets the impact? So there are many companies uh, that uh, have it very clear that in addition to their own users uh, that already know the possible risks, there are others. And uh, there are also people who come to this uh, level of understanding. We uh, want to know uh, how we can prioritize the thing, right? Uh, we have seen a big difference between the Europeans where they know that regulation is coming. So it's a model of business and decisions of high level because they somehow they are part of uh, the regulations of their own company. And regulation is a reality that is going to come shortly. And in the United States, we see that there are some questions, what should be the importance of these topics and why they in invested in the company, especially the SMEs, and they, why do they want to prioritize these kinds of actions with so many other priorities, so many other resources to be uh, applied to be competitive? And there are these stresses uh, that need more clarity. And like this, we will can find a good balance as we have seen until uh, now. And the questions that we made ourselves, what are uh, these incentives that take you to action? Most of them, when we think about internet, what is the meaning of uh, transparency? Uh, what is the importance of human rights and of privacy? And many people bring two, two topics in mind. First is the efficiency in an AI system, a system, the AI that has a new biases that have uh, the appropriate uh, tools to be uh, robust and does not bring error. So efficiency is very important. It's interesting that point becomes priority and it's more pragmatic to uh, be uh, included in all the conversations that we are seeing uh, currently. And the second is uh, about uh, the brand and the reputation. And we can talk ages and ages about the risks and about uh, brainwashing, what does this mean? And if there is an interest that's 
state, at least in the beginning, what are the impacts? Because more and more we hear stories on how the companies that are taking care of the processes but not adequately, how they don't evaluate risks and risk mitigation, they are being affected in most different levels. And even about these prioritizations of the wise, uh, the uh, small, as uh, the SMEs and the startups uh, uh, have uh, produced action in these topics. And then what about uh, human rights? We are not seeing these in the conversation. What is the role of the company between the understanding in its ecosystem in terms of city, uh, country, region?
Okay, we are back after some technical problems. So, Constanza, if you would like to uh, close your presentation, it has to be very fast. Uh, so, we know that we have uh, time restraints, but I conclude uh, these uh, debates and knowledge with the different uh, stakeholders, right? And there are several factors that this is a very complex topic. We don't have easy answers, uh, but we need more space uh, where we can have uh, dialogues uh, that are very candid uh, statements to have a good understanding. One of the prototypes of public policies that we are doing is uh, trying to understand what is the meaning of a regulation in terms of transparency. We are working with companies uh, to test uh, different uh, mechanisms to get uh, some retrofit and create space so if we can to know yes and no, and what are the frictions, what are the balances that are developed so we can mitigate risks without uh, uh, jeopardizing uh, intellectual property competition, but also respecting a deeper uh, dialogue, right? the kind of values uh, that dictate society, that have to be represented in all uh, this uh, arena of uh, artificial intelligence. I will close giving some examples and sharing some points that can be interesting. The first is of UNESCO, where I was one of the 24 people to draft uh, this instrument uh, uh, internationally wise in this first form that is related to two topics. The first is uh, uh, gender equality. And uh, this uh, agenda usually includes uh, uh, several points that dead are not very well seen, but they need their own space. And this, this strategy, women inclusion, is very important. And we have to see the impact that it has in the systems in different aspects that comes uh, from access uh, uh, to participation uh, in the digital economy. And the second one is that uh, all this instrument, and it is very interesting, is to understand uh, exactly what is the important points we have to tackle on the artificial intelligence. Uh, we have to see all the context what climate change is uh, some uh, priority agenda. And we have to ask how to maximize this technology, how to include this in this field and mitigate its negative impacts. And the second the structure, uh, where I also was happy to be a part of, I was able to in introduce the AI Fairness Global Library and this is a library of more 57 uh, uh, resources uh, for artificial intelligence ethic topics that goes through several filters 
and uh, the exercise that we did in Mexico and where we will be showing uh, the, the results in the near future is the first prototype of public policies in Latin America and one of the first international models uh, so that we this can become an inspiration to other companies and also to elaborate more on this uh, subject. And finally, uh, this is one of our, our most important partners in these questions on how can we develop in this region in the ethical use of artificial intelligence. We will be publishing a course for public servants where we can understand very easy what is the meaning of all these ethicals and artificial intelligence components and what the, the role they have in the life cycle of public policies. And at the end, our different resources and inputs that tackle on how we can get the maximum of these technologies that certainly is transforming deep, deeply for the good in many senses and there is a duty of all of us of participating and analyzing those risks and especially in terms of human rights. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Constance. Uh, thank you for having closed your presentation after uh, these technical problems that we have. Unfortunately, there are many questions, but uh, we have very little time, so I believe we can ask one question at least. And uh, it's a very interesting one. We mentioned, and we would like to elaborate a little more about the role of the authority with the data protection, right? Arturo mentioned this, uh, about this role, about the different regions, uh, and how do you believe that the authorities could meet uh, their educational function? That also something that we mentioned, and how they can help the developers in understand how they can apply these principles using artificial intelligence and how could the authorities monitor effectively and enforce the law in terms of protection of personal data and in the use of artificial intelligence. Arturo, if you would like to be very brief in your answer. Yes, uh, well, uh, I, would, I have a meeting, so I cannot say very longer, but I would like to start by thanking Luki for the invitation and you for the moderation that was excellent and always happy to meet Constance and Fabrizio and it's a, a pleasure to get acquainted with you and Alejandro and I hope that we can share uh, uh, the conversations that seems very appropriate. Uh, two points. I would like to try to return to the question and two points that I would like to mention is something in, in, uh, around uh, trust. That is a lack of trust and I would say not only with the governments that there is but in general terms and I believe that here there is a role to be met or perhaps a need of closing this gap, this gap on trust and what can we do, what can the government government to do and what citizens can do in general. I believe that is to use better the spaces as we have already mentioned and to have more dialogue. And Alejandro also uh, was part of the process, uh, this message of a dialogue that is needed between all the stakeholders. And uh, to, give, to bridge this gap of lack of trust, we have to know better the parts and uh, we have uh, to develop it better. And also the Agency of Protection, they have a very important role in this balance. They have to understand uh, going beyond what in some regulations we have already developed in terms of uh, shortcomings and uh, it, uh, they are, we have also to mention uh, this gap between reality and theory and that are not working as they should. And we have to try to make and understand to the population about the importance that the use of personal data have because the regulation by these agencies and most in the, 
in most countries with the resources that they can count now, they won't be able to provide this in a very broad way without the collaboration of society as a whole. So this is uh, in terms of making population aware uh, to provide understanding of why it is important uh, to uh, have this idea uh, and to try to help with all of this. It's a pity, but I have to leave. But thank you very much for the invitation and my congratulations uh, uh, for this event. I saw the first part. Many of the things that was mentioned can apply here too. Luca, thank you for the invitation. And it's a pity, but I have to leave. Bye-bye. Uh, thank you for your uh, statements, Arturo, Constanza. Yes, I would add punctually two things. The first is also the uh, one articulator with the different sectors, which is very important, but also among the different dependencies uh, among the government, we see that is not a topic that is only uh, linked to privacy, but it has a broader aspect in terms of impacts that are brought by artificial intelligence. So we have to coordinate these conversations among different perspectives and different agendas. And I do believe uh, that these institutions where the core is connected to times of privacy and the necessary cares based on this adjacent, they have a certain advantage of being able to be articulators of broad their conversations. So the question is, are they ready for this? And this is an interesting case in England, where the authority has, are uh, increasing uh, their skills to be able to meet these agendas, especially in the transparency and the explications of uh, all the uh, accountabilities. Thank you, Constanza. And I believe that we don't have more time uh, to continue, unfortunately. But thank you very much to all the participants. It was a very interesting uh, debate, and certainly we will have to continue. So now I turn the floor to Luca uh, for uh, his uh, final words. Luca, your microphone is off. Thank you, Maya. Thank you all, all the speakers. And I, I was uh, very interested in this second segment. It was very good. I loved it, despite the technical problem. I thought that the debates uh, were excellent, uh, uh, very good points that were highlighted, a uh, great interest. Uh, and I agree. Uh, with the, not with everything that was highlighted, but most of the points, I believe, that are major challenges, the strategies uh, that have to be tackled. And this is, was something very much mentioned by all the speakers, uh, a big heterogeneity, uh, divergencies in the priorities from different countries, a broad divergency on the level of understanding of the challenges that uh, AI brings, Alejandro mentioned about the multi-sectorial approach that is needed uh, and we need to learn a lot with all of this. And uh, he is one of the pioneers on this and uh, several speakers mentioned the existence of major inequalities, not only on the approaches, but also in the capacities of research and the development of countries in Latin America, uh, not uh, uh, among countries in the region, but uh, uh, among different entities and different sectors of the population with a great example of state-of-the-art application of a artificial agency with total ignorance of how AI is being implemented, what is AI, what is the impact, and I believe that after this discussion that was fascinating, what seems uh, evident is that we have uh, uh, many questions, many possibilities, uh, and a lot of information, ideas of regulation, uh, but we have a triple uh, challenge uh, that has to be faced. First, uh, the, the academic debate, the regulatory debate on how to regulate AI, and it is, we are still far 
from have everything definite and very well based uh, in a consensus. And this was very apparent on these four years of debate of today. The opinions are very despairing, especially of the great difference in terms of artificial intelligence phenomena and understanding. And so this problem requires more discussions, more afters from the different sectors, and uh, also more public debates, uh, more public consultations, like Constanza said, several other speakers, so that the decision-making process uh, be enabled with a greater quality. So we need all this effort and we need time. And this time complicates things exactly because we don't have a lot of time and uh, even in this system of governance, we can change things efficiently, sustainably, and uh, artificial intelligence is happening and the market is already defining uh, how artificial intelligence operates. And here we come to the second challenge, which is bigger, which is the need of the fine as fast as possible a governance system that is efficient and sustainable. It is something urgent and has to be done well. We has to define a system that can encourage innovation and that can create greater uh, protection possible for the individuals, but also create protection and society and something clear, predictable, able to adapt to the technological innovation. And and that is uh, uh, not uh, uh, stuck uh, to the past, but open to the future. And avoid that phenomenon that was a uh, highlight uh, about uh, the lack of trust. Uh, that could be dangerous about something that bring risk, but also bring a lot of potential and a lot of benefits. And this we have to be uh, very clear. It is a side that has to be encouraged, and this is a bigger challenge, and the market is already developing in a very fast pace, and not only uh, the other processes uh, that you don't have the, the, the same speed, but also a possibility of the legislature of being able to understand, even in the most basic level, a topic that is extremely complex. Artificial intelligence is not how to regulate uh, 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 agriculture and uh, agribusiness is very simple. Uh, we need also a, to face a third challenge that is very visible in the regulation of personal data. And that is an essential challenge. So once that we agree with the mechanism of what regulation is the most efficient, the most sustainable, we also need to agree on how to implement it, how to bring regulation to the developer, as Alejandro mentioned. And the experience of data protection, I believe that is very interesting because teaches us because that there is a lay, there is an authority that's a regulator and that needs many efforts. But this is a first stage. You have to create a law. We need to enable an authority. And this doesn't mean that it will have an effective data protection. This is a first step. Data protection needs study to see what are the risks the difficulties that we were going to face certainly with the, the regulation of artificial intelligence. Even in a moment when we can reach consensus about a law or about an authority who is going to regulate and how, and how, uh, how it happened in Europe after 40, 50 years of evolution about uh, how the regulation of personal data needs to be defined, not only in terms of content, but also implementation. There is a lot of work more to be able to create a culture of data protection and a culture of artificial intelligence that is sustainable, regulated as we want it. So, uh, this uh, culture 
uh, that is lacking in the companies that adopted only in the past years uh, fra uh, fra legal frameworks uh, like Brazil did, there is a law, there is an authority uh, that is shaped according to a model of the European authorities, but with many differences. But uh, this is simply a uh, starting point. We still are missing a culture where the individuals, the companies, the public authorities, uh, society as a whole have to be aware of all these uh, challenges and have to cooperate to face the challenge. This is the greatest challenge, in my point of view, that we have with the regulation of protection of artificial intelligence. And certainly a text that is even more complex uh, and that should be developed in synergy with the regulation of personal data. It was excellent to hear the speaker with all the initiatives, the even prototypes of regulation uh, that have high potential to help us to deal with these uh, challenges. We need to be optimistic but uh, we have to balance with a lot of pragmatism. I would like to close uh, then this first Latin American conference about artificial intelligence and data protection, Thanks, thanking once again all the speakers, uh, Danilo, Maya, all the FGV team, Walter, Yasmin, Eduardo, Carol Bia from CGS that help us in the alignment of the event, all the team of the CPDP, Latam, that uh, for two years have been working uh, to promote uh, events uh, like we see today. And also I got to repeat the invitation to check uh, our articles on artificial intelligence for Latin American that is available in the CPDP SAT.8. And I also invite you to follow us in FGV, CGS, CGBP, Latin, and also the Cyberbase project that explores uh, this uh, points because we will have a lot of material and events about artificial intelligence arriving next week and we will public the records of today. There is a lot of material, a lot of research, a lot of ideas uh, to be uh, shared. So once again, thank you very much to all, and I see you uh, on the next uh, event. Goodbye.